Hello and welcome to the Megacast by Actual Tech Media. It's that time of the year again where we're talking about ringing in 2022 with an overhauled data protection and disaster recovery strategy. Thank you so much for joining us on the Megacast today. On this event, you'll hear from the leading companies in the space today, including Zerto, a Hewlett Packard Enterprise company, Rubrik, Pure Storage, Nasuni, and Store One. Before we get started, there's a few things that you should know about the event. My name is David Davis of Actual Tech Media, and I'll be serving as your moderator, along with Mr. Scott Becker. We're all former IT professionals ourselves here at Actual Tech Media. We know how tough it can be out there in the world of enterprise IT, and we want to help to solve your technology challenges. So we encourage your questions there in the questions pane of the audience console, and we'll be doing dedicated Q&A sessions with each of our expert presenters. We even have a best question prize for each of the sessions on the Megacast today, and I'll be talking about that here in just a moment. Of course, we have an awesome lineup of prizes as well. We'll be covering that next, but first, I wanna remind you that we appreciate your participation, not only in the questions pane of your audience console, but also in the poll questions that we'll have periodically during the event. We also want this to be a social event and we encourage your participation in that. We have a Twitter icon there in your audience console. And if you tweet using that icon, the hashtag for today's event will be automatically appended. And then finally, if you check out the handouts tab there, you'll find some hand-selected resources, one for each of the presenters on the event today. We've got eBooks, special trial links, solution briefs, and more. This is a mega cast. I'd like to say we have a mega lineup of prizes. Today is no different. We have five Apple M1 24 inch iMacs in your choice of color. And if that wasn't enough, we have Amazon $500 gift cards after each presentation. Of course, you must be live in attendance to qualify. We will be announcing the winners verbally during the event. We also have our best question prize for $50 Amazon gift cards, one for each of the Q&A sessions on the Megacast today. Prize winners will be selected and contacted via email after the event. All prize winners must meet the actual tech media prize terms and conditions, which you can find there in your handouts tab. All prize winners must submit an IRS Form W-9 to Actual Tech Media, and you always have the option to make a donation to the selected charities. We've donated thousands of dollars to these charities over the years, thanks to generous prize winners such as yourselves who win a prize and would like to help someone less fortunate. When we contact you about your prize winnings, if you'd like to donate your prize value, please let us know. We would love to help. The social media hashtag for today is ATM Megacast, and you can follow Actual Tech Media and me, your moderator as well, over on Twitter. You can subscribe to all the Actual Tech Media social channels, YouTube, Facebook, and the 10 on Tech podcast over in the iTunes podcast store. And we post all of our latest and greatest content on LinkedIn. So make sure that you follow us there as well. You can do that directly from the LinkedIn icon in your audience console. I also want to call your attention to the Gorilla Guide book club. There's a link to it right there in the handouts tab. This is where you can download free, easy to read enterprise IT books authored by top industry experts. It's a great way to stay up to date on trending enterprise technology. Yes, they are all completely free and they work on your mobile device, Kindle, iPad, so that you can take them with you and learn on the go. Another great way to win a prize is to refer an IT friend or coworker to the Actual Tech Media online events, and you both could win a $300 Amazon gift card. Those drawings will be held monthly, and you can refer your IT friends and coworkers using the refer a friend link there in the handouts tab. We promise not to spam your IT friend. We will invite them to a list of events. If they don't join, we'll send them one more reminder because it's easy for the email to get lost in I know busy inboxes out there. But if they don't respond after that second email, we won't bother them anymore. If you enjoy learning here on the Megacast event series, we encourage you to refer your IT friends or coworkers and you both could win a gift card. At the end of the Megacast today, you'll be automatically redirected to the refer a friend page as well. So with it being now the end of 2021, hopefully most of you have already done or have started your 2022 planning. And it's really the ideal time to reflect on 
our disaster recovery plans and our data protection strategy. Stop and ask yourself, do you feel ready? How confident are you in your plan? If you had a ransomware attack, hopefully not, but today, or some sort of natural disaster, or even a disaster created by a human, such as a mass data loss, how quickly could you get your data back and your applications back up and running? I mean, it's unfortunate, but really the number one scariest thing right now for IT organizations of all sizes is the thought of being infected by ransomware. And so if you had to restore every single application and database and file in your company's data center, think about how rapidly could you get all of that data back? I mean, it's a scary time for you and your company's data. We've got massively growing data sets. We've got data distributed across mobile and the internet and SaaS applications. But at the same time, our data is being constantly attacked. And if it can be breached, it will be sold and publicly shared. And even if we pay the ransom, there's still no guarantee that we will get our data back or that we'll get it back in a timely manner. The statistics around cybercrime and ransomware are astounding, no matter where you look, totaling trillions of dollars and companies are going out of business because of it. Thankfully, we've got a lot of really innovative solutions, solutions that leverage cloud to help us with our disaster recovery planning and our rapid recovery. I encourage you to look at solutions that offer some sort of cloud-based aspect, even if it's just to get your data off site, because they give you that utility-based pricing model that's been absent in disaster recovery for a long time. They give you infinite scalability and that elastic demand that you'll need to spin up applications and to store your data on demand and then spin it back down when you don't need it anymore. This kind of push button disaster recovery on demand can be very helpful. And there's a lot of pre-built disaster recovery solutions out there that can make this easier than ever before with built-in automation and really finally make disaster recovery easy. I was an IT manager for many years. We spent over a year doing disaster recovery planning and building our DR plan. And it was a full-time job. It was painful. And even when you're done, you're never really done. And back then it was a very manual process. So I think you'll be very pleased to see some of the new disaster recovery innovations on the Megacast today. At a high level, I encourage you to look for new innovative data protection and disaster recovery solutions that provide high performance backup and rapid recovery. You'll need that in the event of a disaster. You need solutions that are scalable, both for your data as it continues to grow and as your data spans across the cloud and SaaS applications and cloud native and Kubernetes and mobile devices, you've got to find ways to protect it all. But at the same time, it's got to be affordable and these need to be easy to prove and easy to test on a regular and automated basis. They really need to make disaster recovery easy. To me, that's kind of the number one thing to look for is will it be easy for you and your IT organization and to do that, you may need some solid support. So don't forget about that aspect when you're looking for new data protection and DR solutions. So with all that in mind, I'm excited now to ask you a couple of poll questions and then introduce you to our first presenter on today's data protection and disaster recovery megacast. I'm bringing up that first question on your screen now. All right, the first poll question of the event today is on the screen. The question is, which of these are your greatest data protection and disaster recovery concerns in 2022? And this is a multi-select question, so feel free to select more than one option on this poll. I will share the results of this poll with you, and you can see how you stack up with your hundreds of peers who are on the event today from across the United States and around the world. If you haven't answered one of these poll questions before, you do it right there in the slides window. Just select the option that corresponds to you and your company. Uh, maybe you're interested in rapid recovery from disaster, uh, perhaps cloud recovery, backup reliability, immutability of the data to ensure that it's not modified after it's written, data security to ensure that your data is protected, scalability 
uh, protecting cloud native and SaaS applications. Uh, perhaps it's around the affordability of the solution, or if you have another concern that's not listed there, I tried to think of everything, but I'm sure there's something I forgot. Feel free to drop it in the questions pane, and I want to hear from you. I, I will share any comments there in the questions pane. So I see 10 folks have already indicated they had a concern that's not listed. Go ahead and drop it in the questions pane, and I want to hear from you. All right, lots of responses already coming in. Thank you for those. Let me go ahead and share the results of this poll. And it looks like 53% said data security is their top concern, followed almost equally uh, by rapid recovery from disaster. And then right after that, backup reliability. So uh, some very high numbers there, very uh, large concerns, just kind of all the way around, but those were the top three. And then one final poll question before I introduce you to our first presenter. The question on the screen now is, what's your time frame for adding new or updating existing data protection and disaster recovery solutions at your company? So you have some concerns, obviously a, a lot of concerns, uh, that you're looking to overcome in 2022 with your data protection and disaster recovery infrastructure. So what's your time frame for taking some action? Is it in the next six months? Is it six to 12 months, 12 to 24, or you're not quite sure? All right. Thank you to everyone who responded there to the poll question. We do appreciate that feedback. And we'll have multiple polls happening uh, throughout the event. I always appreciate uh, feedback from the actual tech media audience. But with that, it's time to kick off today's megacast with our first presenter. I'm excited now to bring in Carolyn Seymour, Vice President of Product Marketing at Zerto, a Hewlett Packard Enterprise company. Carolyn, thank you for being on. Thank you. It's a pleasure. I'm really going to look forward to this. Thank you. Excellent. Well, we're excited to hear your presentation. Take it away. Thank you. And so let me just move to the next slide here. Yep, we're getting that. So what I'd like to focus the next 20 minutes on is talking to you about five key predictions for 2022. And I'm going to talk about those and then how Zerto and what Zerto has been doing to help you be successful as we look at these important uh, predictions. And so the first one, and this probably comes as no surprise, is around ransomware. But, the, but very specifically, we're focused around the ransomware recovery and the recovery strategies because it's not a matter of, you know, if anymore. It's a matter of when it happens. And the question is, is can you recover if all else fails? And so if you, we just take a quick look at some of the sort of the 2020 stats, and we're still getting the sort of some of the um, 2021, but this is uh, – Phenomenal when you actually look at the cost, 20 billion in 2020. And actually, the 21 days of average downtime after an attack, so that is when you're attacked, um, it typically takes about 21 days. And if you look at the actual cost of recovery, so 1.4 million is the average. Loss of productivity, that includes the reputation damage, the service, and I think that's potentially low. So, of course, we continue to see the increase in, in ransomware and the cost to the business, and that's the problem. So I just want to tell, talk through a tale of uh, two ransomware attacks. And this is a company called Tenkata. Tenkata Protective Fabrics, and they're a, a billion dollar, multi-billion dollar organization, textile manufacturing. And they had a crypto locker attack. They, their backup strategy was... Um, the uh, backup to tape, and then um, the files that were affected were the entire file server itself. And the data loss that they suffered was 12 hours because with backup, that's when was the last backup. But it took them over two weeks to actually recover. And so after that, they implemented Zerto and our continuous uh, data protection with our near-synchronous replication and, and journal-based recovery that allows organizations to be able to uh, quickly recover in, in minutes, 
to seconds prior to an attack. So that RPO seconds and RTO of minutes. And how that compares to periodic backup, as you can see here, is the fact that, uh, you know, the snapshots are taken, whether it's four hours, 12 hours, or overnight. And therefore, you've got a gap in that data loss. And typically, the recovery time is much longer. Unfortunately, Tenkata did suffer a second attack, um, but this time the results were very, very different. With continuous data protection, with Zerto, um, the directories on a file center that were affected were easily recovered. They had 10 seconds of data loss, 10 seconds. And the recovery time was just a matter of minutes, under 10 minutes a huge difference uh, with what they could actually do. And that was enabled through our continuous data protection that provides that granular recovery, whether that's recovering from entire sites, applications, VMs, folders, files, and so forth. And all of that within seconds. The orchestrated uh, workflows, so fully orchestration on being able to recover your applications as a whole consistently and at scale. So all of those multi-VM applications, you can re recover to a consistent state. And then what's also very important as part of your recovery strategy is to actually ensure in the fact that you can do testing and test often that your recovery will indeed work. And what we do is that recovery without impact to any production. So you can recover and test this whenever you want. And of course, we provide compliance requirements too with our reporting and analytics. And in Zerto 9 this year, we actually added additional recovery capabilities for ransomware. We added in the fact that uh, cloud tiering to help support your move to cloud. Um, so it's cost effective as well as also immutability for AWS. And then uh, we added an instant uh, re file restore, an instant VM restore, and we also added in automated VM protection. So to ensure that any of your VMs that are not protected today, it will automatically set up that protection for you so that you are fully recovered. So we've added in loads of capabilities to really help you recover from ransomware when hit. The second prediction is around in-cloud data protection, and it comes no surprise in the fact that cloud first is really the norm. Probably all of you are moving to cloud in some shape or form, and you are within certain uh, levels of maturity, and it continues in the aftermath of COVID. And as you can see, the significant rise in IT spending as it relates to cloud. And so our vision and our goal is to ensure that you can protect work, cloud workloads anyway. You can actually easily protect and migrate your workloads to cloud. You can use cloud as a DR target, as well as also the cloud as a backup target. Disaster recovery within the cloud too. So if you've got new applications and data in the cloud, you can protect them. And we launched a disaster recovery and backup for Kubernetes as well um, for within cloud and across the different platforms you see here. And so what you see here too, is the fact that in, uh, on November the 30th, we actually launched a new solution called Zerto in Cloud for AWS. And very simply put, that is orchestrated disaster recovery at scale for Amazon EC2 instances. And we launched this at reInvent earlier this year, and it was to solve very specific challenges that our customers and prospects have told us as they've been implementing AWS. And that is, of course, from the protection of disruption, um, the normal protection issues that people have. But the challenge is, is the limited backup and recovery capabilities that other solutions within AWS have, and including AWS Replication 2, the scalability issues, the lack of automation, and, and the, the, the challenges around the speed of recovery. And the complexity, because if you have a solution with agents, it adds to the complexity as the larger the deployment. And so... There are real complexity around the management and ongoing maintenance. And so Zerto in Cloud for AWS um, is orchestrated disaster recovery. It has very simple workflows um, that are fully orchestrated for failover live, test, and recovery workflows too. And what's important is through the protection groups that we can actually provide application-centric protection. So if your applications are made up, which they 
probably are, of multiple VMs, we can protect and recover the large, complex applications as a consistent uh, and logical entity. And then again, um, ensuring that you can test and test often, so you can do failover testing of all of instances in a designated AWS region or zone itself. And all of that orchestration really helps to simplify the management. But further to that, we have a, a single Zerto in Cloud Manager um, appliance. It's a Linux appliance. And you only have one in it you, that you are, uh, install, regardless of the size of, of what your, your deployment is. And for those of you familiar with Zerto, it has that same GUI interface and user management experience. But we also um, implement disaster recovery as code, meaning which is API-centric. And we have, um, through Swagger, the ability to be able to um, um, uh, integrate into existing automation processes, or through pre-built bash scripts, you can interface at the command line. So you have total flexibility. And there are no agents with the solution as well. And it has secure management, of course. And then lastly, we've added in the analytics to be able to help you monitor the RPO and the journal and the networking requirements and to give that visibility and status of the protection groups too. And so simply put, Zerto in cloud delivers that simplicity, simple implementation, deployment, and it's flexible and open, being able to integrate into your existing tech stack. And very importantly, it helps you scale across your multiple uh, the, you know, from tens to thousands of VMs. And we support across 17 different regions and availability zones and, and accounts. And we have included analytics for insights. So that was what was new. And that expands what we can do, as you can see here, of your AWS environment. So if you're heavily invested, we can help you migrate. You can use AWS as a DR target. You can back up to AWS. Um, now you can actually implement and deploy disaster recovery within AWS, and we'll talk about uh, Kubernetes in a moment, which takes us to our next prediction, which is about next-gen data protection. As more organizations are building out microservices, the need to actually protect um, those uh, Kubernetes applications that you're building out, and as you can see here, the growth in container deployments continues in 2022. And earlier this year, we launched Zerto for Kubernetes to address these key challenges that we saw um, as companies are building out their Kubernetes applications. There are limited um, uh, backup and recovery uh, solutions out there, particularly around disaster recovery, and the, there's no application-centric approach that so goes back to protecting that whole application again. So we introduced Zerto for Kubernetes, which is continuous backup, disaster recovery, and mobility for Kubernetes applications. And that's utilizing, for utilizing data, persistent data, whether that's on-premises or actually cloud. And what we've done is to bring continuous data protection to Kubernetes that provides that automated and consistent non-disruptive recovery. So you get all of the benefits around that near synchronous replication with no in production impact. You get those granular checkpoints so that you can actually ensure that you can recover to within seconds. And you're providing that, um, again, the best of breed RPOs and RTOs. And so Zerto for Kubernetes um, provides one, Data protection as code, what we like to refer it to, is which is the ability to be able to, to create and deploy your applications that are born protected. So that's a very key differentiator, and this is purpose-built for Kubernetes. Again, we've got that application-centric to ensure your applications as a whole can be protected. We provide those fully orchestrated workflows, as well as also ensuring that you can um, support across hybrid and multi-cloud, and we provide analytics to ensure that you have a centralized view. And then, of course, we add in the APIs and automation to help you simplify your operations. And so Zerto for Kubernetes, as you can see here, supports, for example, uh, OpenShift, Amazon EKS, uh, IBM Cloud Kubernetes Services, Google, Azure, and we just launched also the VMware Tanzo, and more to come um, in the new year. 
So that was predict uh, number three. So let's talk about the prediction number four. And this goes back to also really the cloud too, because there are more and more SaaS uh, implementations and deployments, and the need for protecting SaaS workloads is increasing. And there was a quite a frightening stat in the fact that um, by from Gartner in a report that by 2022, 70% of organizations will have suffered a business disruption due to unrecoverable data loss. And it's interesting because more and more re organizations are realizing now that, that there is a need to back up your data because as you can see here, what the SaaS provider's responsibility for, and it's not your data. The data, it's your data, and it's your responsibility. So you have to have a separate solution to be able to ensure that you are protected. So you need to back up your SaaS data. And so we introduced Zerto Backup for SaaS uh, for Microsoft 365, for Google Workspace, Salesforce, and Microsoft Dynamics. And it's powered by Keepit, the leader in SaaS backup and disaster recovery. It's very simple and easy to use, and it has a very uh, granular recovery. And you can store you know, uh, the retention of your data for as long as there's no limits on that. And it is secure with immutability to support your ransomware um, or protect against ransomware. So... Zoto Backup for SaaS is really uh, ensuring that it delivers that granular recovery right down to things like the emails, the team science, the permissions, and so forth. And again, ensuring in the fact you're protected from ransomware with the immutability with an independent, secure backup of your data. And so why Zerto for SaaS Backup? Well, um, you know, you can now, with Zerto, back up your, your SaaS data, and it's everything's provided by one vendor. So if you're invested with Zerto today, you now have the opportunity to take SaaS backup too. And, of course, it's simple and it's secure. Our last prediction is really around disaster recovery as a service. And we're starting to see this really accelerate, and there are a couple of reasons for that. And in, certainly in 2022, we see the growth, and um, according to um, IDC, I think this was that uh, the global drag market is growing by 23%. And there are a couple of big reasons for that. One is the availability of, of the low-cost DRAS offerings um, that you can quickly get up and running that's actually facilitating the adoption of DRAS. And I think the other key aspect of that is, is the cyber, number of cyber attacks, as we've talked about. It comes back to that again. And it's another compelling reason to have a robust DR strategy, and DRAS enables you to be able to quickly implement. And so there was a recent study by Gartner on the DRAS motivation, and I know this one's a bit difficult to see, so if we just hone in a little bit. There are a lot of organizations, and you may be one of them, in the fact that it's difficult with the skill set that you have is how do I actually implement? That's a number one, 53%. Um, felt that, you know, this is one of the reasons why. And you can see some of these. I'm not going to go into them. I haven't got the time today. But you can see there are multiple reasons. And, again, um, all the list of items as to why DRAS is, presents a great opportunity for you. Now, it's interesting because, you know, when you look at the DRAS spectrum, one size it does not fit all. If you're not going to do it yourself, so do your own disaster recovery on site and manage it yourself, there is that ability through DRAS to self-service, um, which um, you're, you're not managing the infrastructure and so forth, but it is you're managing the, the process itself. And then you can have it partially managed as well as also right to the other end of the spectrum to fully managed. And you have the ability uh, to select uh, what type of DRAS that you want. And we have over 350 managed service providers worldwide. And as you can actually see here, in the last Gartner Magic Quadrant for DRAS, nine of the top 11 were powered by Zerto, and I think that's actually gone up to 10 now. And we continue to deliver that best of breed, the fastest RPO and RTOs. And when you think about it, you know, Zerto is the DR in DRAS itself. 
Last year, we, Serto got acquired by HPE, and we did do an announcement um, in September that we are going to be integrating into HP GreenLake. And when you think about what GreenLake is, is, it's really about unlocking your data value. It's an as-a-service offering that really brings the cloud-like flexibility to your data centers and other locations like satellite and remote offices. And Zerto is going to be integrated into and delivering disaster recovery as a service and migration as a service as part of the cloud data services and integrated into the cloud console. And what that provides is a consumption-based model, meaning that you only pay for what you use, but you're still getting all the value of what Zerto delivers, and so you'll see more and more integration. Um, as part of the Green Lake too. So we're excited to be able to offer an additional value to our customers and prospects. And I know that was a whistle-stop tour from the 2022 predictions. So we're offering, so we are predicting ransomware recovery strategies becomes more critical. And it's not just about the um, being able to uh, defend or, or the uh, the uh, uh, is protecting against, but you need to have a good recovery strategy in place. And we've added that uh, many new capabilities to be able to support that, as well as also our continuous data protection and recovery. In data cloud, data protection is more and more applications and data moves to the cloud, really expanding out our offering set. We just launched Certo in cloud for AWS. And then as more microservices and new applications being built in Kubernetes were added, Zerto for Kubernetes, and then we added Zerto Backup for SaaS, powered by Keepit to protect your SaaS workloads. And we're adding more and more capabilities to help facilitate the uh, disaster recovery as a service. And our vision is really to ensure that wherever your data and your workloads are, from edge to cloud, edge to core to cloud, we can actually protect. And we always deliver the core tenants that, from a continuous enterprise class and simplicity. So wherever your workloads are, we can help protect those from whatever disaster happens. And if you want to experience Zerto, please try our hands-on lab. We've got new labs. You want to try and see how Zerto recovers from ransomware to within seconds of an attack, we have a lab for that. So it's a great way to see how Zerto helps you recover from ransomware. And then we have, we've have we just introduced a Zerto for Kubernetes lab too that allows you to see how Zerto protects and as data protection as code for Kubernetes. And then lastly, we've just introduced a Zerto for AWS lab. But there are more labs available, so check out zerto.com.labs. And so with that, um, whistle stop tour. I'd like to thank you for your time today and hope that you found the information useful. And now I just hand over back, maybe for some Excellent. questions. Absolutely, yeah. Excellent presentation, Caroline. Uh, we do have some questions for you from the audience. While we take those questions, I'm just going to bring up this poll for everyone out there that says, what additional information would you like about Zerto? And obviously there's a, a lot of interest and uh, excitement here because we, we have a ton of questions coming in for you. So. I encourage everyone to respond to that poll there. I'll just leave that up again while we take your questions. First question for you, Carolyn, I see here they're asking uh, about immutability. How is immutability achieved? And can you have immutable copies in the cloud and on premises? Right, so we are today, we, we launched this year immutability that's available for AWS. We're going to be introducing Azure, so we continue to strengthen that side of it. And as I said, with Zerto's uh, SaaS for backup, you've got immutability with off-site data backup too. Um, we use actually the native object, um, you know, lock feature uh, in AWS to, to actually achieve that. Hopefully that'll help answer the question. Absolutely, yeah. And then another question, does uh, Zerto Kubernetes cover the AKS deployments? Yes, yeah, so um, good question. We, we support OpenShift, AKS, GKS, the Google, the Azure, the, uh, the, uh, the um, Amazon, which is the EKS. Uh, we announced uh, Tanzu earlier this year as well. And so there's another one as well, uh, IBM Kubernetes services as well. And we will continue to uh, add additional platforms. Rancher is one that we're actually looking at as well in the early new year. 
Excellent. Yeah, a lot of different Kubernetes support there. Very cool. Um, what about, you know, you talked about the GreenLake availability. Uh, this person's asking, will Zerta be available outside of the GreenLake platform as well? Yeah, great question. And maybe I was remiss to actually mention that. We are really excited that uh, we're going to be delivered as a service as part of GreenLake. But absolutely, Zerta will continue to be sold as a standalone offering. What the GreenLake um, integration will do is give another um, option available for organizations that are looking at, at the different value, a consumption-based model. So it's really just adding additional flexibility from a deployment perspective. So whatever your deployment, we can help you with. So yes. Nice. I like that consumption-based um, offering yeah. there. Very cool. Um, what about instant recovery? They're asking which platforms is it available on? Yeah, so the instant um hmm, the instant VM recovery is um uh, is a restore workflow that's actually available from the local continuous replication that's on premise. So that's where we're where we're doing the instant uh, VM recovery. Got it. Okay. And then uh, let's see there's a couple folks out here who are from SMB smaller companies uh, can Zerto help them out as well, or is this just for larger enterprises? No, um, we 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 have um, over um, coming up to about ten thousand customers now, um, and uh, you know we we across different eighty different countries and um, of of industry of all industries and of companies of all sizes. So it's not just for um, uh, large enterprises. We protect from whether it's tens of um, you know VMs right up to thousands of VMs so uh, really and we as I say we we support across different industries um, so yes you know we are absolutely across the spectrum okay very nice I like that um, here they're asking how often can you back up or copy to the long-term retention storage yeah so um, uh, with the Zerto backup for that, so it's um, you know it's unlimited, and so really, um, oh actually you asked me how often. So actually the um, you can do it nightly, uh, weekly, um, monthly, and yearly. And actually at the CLI level, you can actually do it more frequent um, over to your your long term retention. So the journal journaling capability goes up to 30 days, so you can have that great five second recovery uh, checkpoint. Um, but, you know, you can determine really uh, how often you want to um, back up to your uh, long-term retention repository. Very nice. And one of the coolest things I think you talked about here, I mean, there's a lot of cool stuff, but one of the coolest things was the uh, Zerto Labs. So it was zerto.com slash labs, and there were Kubernetes, uh, AWS, uh, and, and a number of other labs, ransomware recovery labs as well. So uh, a yeah. really cool yeah, offering there from Zerto. Uh, Carolyn, I'm afraid that's all the time we have here in our live Q&A session. I see over 30 questions still available for, for us we didn't have time for. So maybe you can get back to some of those folks. But thank you so much for being on the Megacast today. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And for more information on Zerto, check out the Handouts tab there in your audience console. You'll find a solution brief on Zerto in cloud for AWS. All right, I'll leave up the poll question for anyone to, to answer who hasn't yet done so while I announce our first set of prize winners. We have an Amazon $500 gift card going to Scott Harris from Missouri, congratulations. And our first grand prize, this is for our first uh, one of five Apple M1 24-inch iMacs in your choice of color. This one's going out to Chris Brooks from Georgia. Congratulations. And with that, it's now time for our next presenter on today's Megacast. I'm excited to welcome back Mr. Joshua Stenhouse, field CTO at Rubrik. Hey, Josh, it's good to have you back on. Hey, David, how are you? Doing great, doing great. Looking forward to your presentation here. Take it away. 
Me too. The, the sweet irony of me going after Zerto, but hey, quick search on LinkedIn will help anyone out, figure that one out. But uh, yeah, thank you for having me. So I'm right in saying we've got 20 minutes. Let's go. So this is a mega cast. Thank you for having me, everyone. Looking forward to giving you some good content. And what I want to start with is just level setting on if we're going to be looking at overhauling your strategy in 2022, then it's important to establish what are we designing to defend against. And I'm sure you all agree that we're defending against ransomware attackers. And so we've got to break it down to then decide, well, how are we going to defend against it? And so first of all, attackers break in, they traverse a network, and the first thing they do is not immediately encrypt the data because, no, that is not going to maximize their impact or maximize their chance of getting a payday. So the first thing that they now do is they exfiltrate any data that they are, can access as part of a double extortion. And even if the attacker isn't successful in doing this, every ransom note now says, I have exfiltrated your data and I'm going to release it unless you pay anyway. After they've done that, the next step is they come and they try and compromise your data protection and your backup platforms. And so now the inherent posture of these platforms, their data and their management interfaces, is the difference between immediately having to pay the ransom or not. So there's multiple things that you have to factor in for protecting the backups to ensure that the attacker can't delete them. But after that, then they will go and actually encrypt the data and leave the ransom. And your likely first indicator of compromise is going to be somebody seeing a ransom note or a set of encrypted files in a system, and they're looking at the tip of the iceberg. How big is the blast radius of the attack is the next most common challenge. So you can actually break this down into three distinct problems that we all need to have as New Year's resolutions to solve for. Number one, if the attacker gets in and gets a domain admin account, how can we ensure there is no way that they can remove our ability to recover, whether that's replication, disaster recovery, or backups? Everything that a domain admin can log into is now in the scope of the attacker. So how can we protect it and ensure the fastest recovery speed? Second, if endpoint protection fails, how do we know what to recover and from when? Because there's a tendency to overly focus on number one and say, well, I'm good. I've ensured I've got my data. But if you don't know what data to recover from when, your downtime can still be measured in weeks. And then third of all, you might still face the prospect of having to pay if you don't even have a handle on what data was within the attack and then like, therefore likely exfiltrated. So hopefully these are the three things that you're concerned about and you're looking to solve for in 2022. And if they are, I'm now going to take you through how we can help you get there. And we'll start with number one. But if we're going to start talking about protecting backups, we do have to level set on some key terms. Because you'll hear the word immutability said a million different times by now, every vendor in the world. And immutability is important because it's whether something can or cannot be edited. But immutable backups still can be expired. So you, may, you need to make sure that you're combining immutability with a retention lock to ensure an admin can't just expire it or change the clock to 2050 and expire them anyway. But furthermore, you need to consider where are you enabling that immutability? Because if that is in a secondary location, then how long is it going to take you to download all of that data to recover it? Because that is going to be what you'll have to do in an attack. And that is going to have a big impact on your recovery time. And you also need to make sure that your backups themselves aren't a risk of exfiltration in itself because we know attackers are going straight to backup platforms and exfiltrating the data from there. For that, you need an air gap. No air gap simply means the backups are accessible. They're online from the network. They're on a browsable, mountable file system. The only clean definition of a physical air gap is tape removed from the system. Everything else is a logical air gap. But you do need a logical air gap to make sure that the attackers can't access your backups. And so your first resolution of protecting your backups, you need to look at what is your current posture. Your current posture, if you're not using Rubrik, is likely backup software writing to some sort of disk-based dedupe target. And the problem with this approach is the attackers compromise Active Directory. They get a domain admin account. It's probably just a username and password to log into backup. They just simply log in and delete the backups. Or they go straight to the underlying file system where the backups are being dumped and delete them from there. Best example is the Sony attack. And a major attack is now an unrecoverable event. And we see vendors with this architecture do two things to protect you. One, they'll tear it to cloud and say, well, protect it there. 
but now your recovery time is weeks to download it, and that's presuming you selected the correct point in time. Or two, they'll say, we know this is completely compromisable, but we will sell you a third lot of this infrastructure to protect you, which is now extremely expensive and pretty galling in the fact that I am only have to buy this because your first one isn't protected. And so this is the core change of what Rubrik revolutionized in the market six years ago in that we came to market with the first natively air-gapped and immutable solution, and we modernized backup by converging backup software and backup storage. And everything that is now table stakes in the industry, HTML5, API first, scale out, cloud tiering, live mount, they're all now table stakes. You could watch five presentations by five vendors, and it all sound the same, pretty boring. But one key change that Rubrik made that now makes it the strongest Default posture when it comes to security on your network is the fact that you physically cannot separate the backup software from the backup storage. This isn't secondary storage. You can't just take this and replace a data domain. You can't just take this and replace the software and write to a data domain or whatever else in your environment. You have to replace everything, and you physically cannot separate them. And what this allows us to do is once you've ingested the backups into Rubrik and replaced that entire stack, it then goes on a proprietary file system that is not using any standard storage protocols. There's no NFS. There's no SMB. There's no way you can browse, access, or mount that file system from the network. So you have a native logical air gap built in where the backups cannot be accessed. And furthermore, they're on a natively immutable file system. So this file system isn't general purpose read-write. This isn't created to serve a multitude of use cases. It's purpose-built for the security of your backups. So at the core operating system level, you physically cannot modify a backup once it's being written. And therefore, a major attack is now a recoverable event from the first copy, giving you the fastest recovery speed. And yes, you can send copies of data elsewhere. You can send it to cloud. You can make it immutable there. You can replicate to another site and just send the changes. These are all pretty standard and, again, table stakes. But the key difference in an attack is that I have a local copy for the fastest recovery speed that cannot be compromised by the attacker. And so this is the biggest difference of rubric versus anything else in the market, because everything else is either compromisable or accessible on the local network because of its default posture, and rubric isn't. But you still need to consider the rights of a backup admin and just the default posture of the OS and the software. So the best way to think about rubric in a data center is a bunker in a box or a series of boxes together in a cluster, and it's a hard and secure build of Linux. Absolutely no windows in this stack. I cannot take any solution seriously in 2021, never mind 2022. If you think that it's going to withstand an attacker and you're based on windows, you're completely wrong. Every single windows environment is compromised in every attack, and just building a second domain is not going to help it. If you can compromise one domain, you'll compromise the second domain. The only solution is no windows in your last line of ransomware defense that needs to be continuously patched by the vendor for both the default posture of the OS and the security and the backup software with no shell or OS access. On top of that, we have our, we have our immutable file system, no third-party applications, so there's no ability to run other vendor software on top of Rubrik because all that does is increase your attack vector. We have end-to-end -end encryption and flying at rest, plug in your own key management server. So this means the only thing on the network is the interface. And so the key thing you have to protect are the logins. And this is where Rubrik, and this is massively differentiated, and what you need to look at when you're overhauling your data strategy is multi-factor authentication should not be something after the fact. It shouldn't be, oh, nicey, nice, please can you add this and enable it. If you're overhauling in 2022, it needs to be baked in and always on. And that's exactly what Rubrik has. We have our own built-in MFA using TOTP time-based one-time passwords, scan a QR code from your smartphone. Within 30 seconds, you've now secured any account. And so, yes, the attacker can get the password, but if they don't have your smartphone, they're not getting into backups. And interestingly, the local account on the backup platform is what we see customers use as a break glass account in the event of an attack, because AD is down. I can't use my AD logins. They've been compromised. I need a local account, but it needs to be protected. You can, of course, still plug in your own AD account. Anything SAML 2.0 compliant will suffice. Alerts and syslog for any failed logins, role-based access control, least privilege access. But the core concept here is that if you're going to overhaul in 2022, you need to make sure that you're standardizing on a last line of defense 
from ransomware, a backup platform that has no single login that doesn't have MFA, because that in itself would stop the majority of attackers in their tracks. If you don't have MFA on a login, then you can consider it compromised in an attack. But this is still not enough because there are three other loopholes. So the major one is a backup admin going rogue and expiring backups. So for that, you need retention lock. Now, a lot of vendors do retention lock, and it's either in the cloud, and then once configured, you can't remove it, and they'll happily charge you for 10 years of retention, which is too strict. Or it's logging in as a different role, a security compliance officer, and toggling a switch, which is too insecure. Rubrics retention lock is the perfect in-between where it's a support-driven process. You can still do your job. Backups still expire as per their normal policy, but you can't make an arbitrary change that would negatively impact the retention or the locality. And the only way you can make a change is to create a support ticket. Rubric then verbally contacts the people you specify. You have to log in, open a tunnel, and then the change can be made. This is also combined with removing any node or cluster resets. And the final gotcha out there for everything you take every other backup solution out there or disaster recovery solution out there in the world today, change the clock to 2050 and see what happens. The answer is your recovery is broken, everything's expired. With Rubrik and our zero trust approach to data protection, we don't even trust the time given to us. Something inside each bunker in a box is called a monotonic clock measuring the passage of time. It knows enough seconds have not passed for it actually be to, to be 2050 and it won't expire the backups any differently. There's this CAS, it validated SEC and FINRA compliant. And it's only when you put all of these together that you can say, my backups and my data are impenetrable from a ransomware attacker. And that is why Rubrik is the only vendor in the market in the world today that has a $5 million ransomware recovery warranty. Everyone else, they can't make that guarantee because either they don't own the file system or there is a multiple different attack vectors where they can't make the guarantee because they can't control everything, let alone the time. So you have to have all of these. This needs to be your wish list for 2022 in what we're going to overhaul too. But we're only on problem statement number one, protecting the backup. If you don't know which to recover and from what point in time, you're still going to spend potentially weeks figuring that out. So the next key thing is, well, then how do we detect what has been attacked and what to recover? And this is where you'll hear vendors say, I do anomaly detection. And the problem with anomaly detection is that, quite frankly, it is absolutely useless. It's useless on the front end because all you're going to get is false positives. And it's useless in an attack because all it's going to say is anomaly, 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 and it won't even tell you what's been encrypted. So the big difference of where Rubrik is helping our customers here is we have built-in encryption detection. Where, yes, it starts with anomaly, but then it automatically does a second-level scan to then look at file creations, deletions, modifications, the attributes, and then scans inside any new file created looking in at its entropy and randomization to tell you, I found an actual encryption attack on these files. It's not signature based, so it's not vulnerable to a zero day attack. It automatically removes the false positives of generic anomaly detection because it's useless. And it cannot miss the one thing that all attacks have to do, which is encrypt the data. You then get a granular impact assessment from your last line of defense. It's these 500 servers, these 10,000 files that have been encrypted. This detection is run within 15 minutes of each individual backup. So it's a great use case to consider backing up more frequently. And critically, it reduces your start time to recovery because you don't now have to go and figure out what's been encrypted. Rubrics told you. And you can plug this into your CMOS or tooling with pre-built integrations into Cortex-X or IBM QRadar Splunk and ServiceNow because it can't be incumbent on a data protection team to alert security teams at 2 a.m. on a Saturday just because it was found from the backup platform. And then third, this also then allows you to automate the recovery because there is a gap here. You also hear vendors say, I do anomaly de detection and I can recover the encrypted files. But the thing that they're relying on you missing is, well, how do you get a list of what was encrypted? And then furthermore, how do you feed that in and then automate its recovery? And the answer is a manual time consuming process. But because Rubrik can tell you exactly what was encrypted, we can then point, click, go, and automate recovering only the encrypted data and files. So especially when it comes to files and unstructured, this is going to massively speed up your recovery time. For operating systems, you have to be more careful because you could be recovering the backdoor or the attacker or the malware. So you can test the recovery to verify the state. You're using the massively scale-out compute available by virtue of standardizing on Rubrik. 
as a rule of thumb, 100 VM live mounts per two your points. Once you've made that decision to recover, we recommend you recover in place, where we'll take the shutdown imp impacted production virtual machines. We will then rewind them back in time using a reverse change block tracking mechanism to rewind them back to, let's say, Monday morning at 2 a.m., and then immediately bring them back online from that previous point. So you can liken it to a time machine for all your production virtual machines, rewound from your deduplicated backups. That is an absolute win-win. You haven't had to have multiple copies of your VMs on other production storage elsewhere. You've got immediate production level performance. And now you're preserving your backups as your evidence because they're immutable, they can't be changed, and you can put them on legal hold. And it's only when you put all of this together that you're saying to your business that we can reduce the recovery time and the business impact of a ransomware attack. And we can make sure that it is quicker to recover from backups than it is to try and pay the ransom and recover. But now we've only done two of the three. The third problem, the elephant in the room, is the, the exfiltration, the double extortion. So the first thing to say here, of course, the data protection platform cannot tell you what has left a building. But here's the secret. Nothing can tell you what has left a building because the attacker already circumvented all of your security controls. They've made their own backdoors and they're siphoning off at will. So given that, and you all then ask the question of, well, what is likely exfiltrated? The secret is right in the middle of the screen here in the fact that because Rubrik can tell you exactly what was encrypted, this is now the minimum that you have to consider exfiltrated because if they can encrypt it, they could definitely access it. And if they could access it, now you have to consider it exfiltrated. So what Rubrik will also tell you is built into that bunker in a box is what was in it by a built-in sensitive data discovery. Think about backup, incredibly busy 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. Rest of the time, it does nothing. We use that compute with 60 plus pre-built analyzers, you can also put your own custom regex and pattern analyzers on top. And we'll tell you what sensitive data is in your backups. There's no dedicated team or a learning curve. And critically, we're able to combine this with the view on the encrypted files for your risk posture as to what was likely exfiltrated. And of course, this is just in an attack. Most customers use this day to day for general data discovery purposes. But if you look at your own data protection platform today, if it can't tell you what it's backing up, then one, that's a huge wasted opportunity because you don't know what you're even backing up. But two, in the event of an attack, you lose that ability to get a view on well, what was in the data that was likely stolen. Now, one key thing I like to mention here is that this isn't a direct replacement for an actual data classification tool. It can't update or tag metadata in files because it runs against the backup. And the backup is immutable, cannot be changed. But that's also the biggest single benefit because you can ask big questions and get big answers with no production IO impact because it runs against backup. And backup is hopefully the one thing that touches everything in your environment. So that's the three things that you need to look for for ringing in 2022. But I'm going to give you one bonus one that I would also put on my wish list of if I'm going to overhaul, I'm also going to look for this. Because there is one big problem when it comes to recovering from backups, and that is threat hunting and selecting what is my clean point in time. Because you've shut down and you've contained your production incident, and now you've got to figure out, well, what point in time do I recover to? I've got my backups, but anything with an operating system, when is a clean recovery point before the attacker was in my environment loading the malware? And the process is going to be time consuming. You're going to bring in forensics teams, they're going to require multiple recoveries where they have to load tools and scan. They're then going to have to build a list of what service to recover and from what point in time. And that is going to be the time consuming process because you have a whole team sat there with a button ready to push recover, but they don't know what to recover and from what point in time. So if you're going to build a wish list of what you want in 2022, what you want is the ability to specify a YAR rule which is a list of indicators of compromise so you can hunt for threats, but you'd be able to throw that YAR rule and then have your data protection platform tell you this is the last clean recovery point. Because rather than having to do a thousand recoveries just to then scan it and find out, no, this isn't clean, give me a thousand more, you can throw this at rubric and it will say, okay, from the last 14 days of backups for these 1,000 servers, this is the clean recovery point without 
requiring a recovery to scan, and it speeds up your forensics and your decision-making process, and then you only need one recovery. And so you wrap this together. If you're going to look at overhauling 2022, this is what you need. It's not just about protecting the backups. It's about detecting encryption, automating recovery, identifying sensitive data at risk from exfiltration, and hunting for threats. There you go. I think I just did 20 minutes, 10 seconds. Wow, incredible presentation, Joshua. Uh, we've got a ton of great feedback here already coming in from the audience. I've just got, I'm just going to uh, bring up this poll question for everyone out there that says, what additional information would you like about Rubrik? And we'll leave that up while we take your questions. So uh, let's see, Joshua. Jason said, I'm really impressed. Uh, Joseph said, we're hoping to engage with Rubrik on 2022. in 2022. Great stuff. Larry said, this is amazing. Uh, Patrick said, Rubrik is fantastic. Uh, so <laughs> a very impressive presentation and you know, product offering here from Rubrik. Rubrik um, first question I wanted to ask you that came in, they're wanting to know uh, about, you, know, you mentioned MFA. They say they already have Okta MFA in place. Uh, could that work with Rubrik? Yeah, 100%. So you'll use Okta for your AD users and groups. We actually use that ourselves, although I probably shouldn't say that because it's being recorded. But um, that still isn't going to work for local accounts on your backup cluster because they can't be integrated by the sheer fact that they're local. And if you're not able to access Okta, how are you going to recover? The answer is the local account. So all customers now use our built-in MFA for local accounts, and then they'll use the likes of Okta for everything else. Got it. Okay. Another question here, Jason's asking, how often can I back up my data to Rubrik? So you can back up your data on an hourly basis um, via snapshots. Most customers do 24 hours. You can also enable CDP for VMware VMs and get more frequent points in time. But all of the scanning capabilities around encryption detection and sensitive data discovery are done on snapshots. They're not done on CDP. Because yes, Rubrik can do recovery points in 15, 30, 45 seconds, but you can't scan each of those just because that would be physically impossible. But it is possible to do both and answer a traditional CDP slash DR use case from this secure appliance. Got it. OK. Uh, Sean is asking, can Rubrik back up GCP and Azure workloads? We, we can, yeah. So you can either back them up cloud native, and we're just taking snapshots API calls, and we do that via our single pane of glass, which is a SaaS platform called Polaris. Or you can run Rubrik inside them and then back up to a cluster and send it anywhere else. We also do O365 natively, either to your own Azure subscription as a service or to Rubrik's Azure Cloud, where you don't even have to provide your own account. And everything is cloud to cloud. We're not trying to pull it back on premises. Excellent. And then next question they want to know, um, is there a security solution for each layer of the anatomy of a ransomware attack? I, I could say that many different ways. But I'd say the key thing in general is that this is not a replacement for anything other than your last line of ransomware defense. And then it gives you the ability to bring in your security and forensics teams to then have an additional layer of insight and capability on recovery. So I had a question earlier today, which was like, oh, so I don't need CrowdStrike. And I'm like, no, you most definitely do. Because if you can stop an attack, then you, may, you want to make sure it doesn't happen. But this is what you need if everything else fails. Got it. OK. And then what about, here's a good question. What's the hardest part about fighting off attackers or hackers? Hmm. The hardest part is when people think that a, an attacker getting in is a failure. You're, there always is the ability for the attacker to get in. And that's not a failure if they get in. The failure is if you can't respond and recover and get them out and get back online. Just thinking that you can go your, your entire you know, life in IT and, and never have an attacker on your network is, is incredibly naive and also counterproductive because then you're not going to build the sufficient controls in your environment, presuming that they work. And so, yes, I know zero trust is an overused phrase, but my argument is if, it, if you're going to apply the principles of zero trust to anything, 
then your data protection platform is the number one place you need to do it because it is your last line of defense. That's a, yeah, a whole different perspective there. Good insight. Um, Richard is asking about your, your bonus resolution that you offered there at the end. Uh, when is it available? Mm. So that is in the rubric 7.0 release, which is planned for a January release timeframe subject to the usual, but yeah, we'll, we'll be releasing in January. Exciting. Yeah. Cool stuff. Um, let's see. Another uh, question Eric is asking, what type, type of data retention timeframe do you suggest to truly defend against a ransomware attack? A daily, hourly, weekly? So most definitely daily for 30 days is your minimum. But there has been a change there because a year ago, everybody started thinking, oh, I need to keep dailies for multiple months in order to go back if an attack is lingering. And all we've proven is that that's not true because even if the attacker was in your environment that time, which actually we're consistently seeing that time go down, but the other fact is that you wouldn't accept multiple months of data loss to go back to a point in time before the attacker was there. You're more likely to just spend more time on forensics, removing them from the most recent copy and not accept multiple months of data loss. So as long as you have daily backups for 30 days and a local immutable copy, then what we've seen consistently from attacks in our customer base is that you have the most optimum range and the fastest recovery. Wise advice. Wise advice. I like that. Um, I'm afraid, Joshua, we're running out of time here in our live Q&A session. There's, I see about 30 other questions still we didn't have time for. Obviously, a lot of excitement around Rubrik. Uh, if folks want to get started with Rubrik, what's the easiest way? What do you recommend? Oh, just go to rubric.com. The chat bot will pop up and say, I need Rubrik, and they'll help you out. <laughs> awesome. I like it. All right. Well, it's been great having you on the event again, Joshua. Take care, and we'll see you next time. Take care, Matt. Thank you. All right. For more information on Rubrik, check out the handout still uh, available there in the handouts tab. It is on uh, how Rubrik prevents disruption from ransomware attack uh, for a specific company out here, a client case study, uh, the challenge and the results. So make sure that you check that out. You can see the business outcomes that they experienced when they had a ransomware attack and how Rubrik was able to step in and remediate. Make sure that you check out that case study. All right, I'll leave up the poll question for anyone out there who hasn't yet responded while I announce our next prize winners. We have an Amazon 50, or sorry, $500 gift card going to Ras, sorry, Ava Rasuli from California. Congratulations. And our next grand prize for another Apple M1 24 inch iMac in your choice of color. This is going to Brad Griesick from Illinois, congratulations. It is now time for our next presenter on today's Megacast. I'm excited to bring in now Lucas Bobroff, Principal Data Architect at Pure Storage. Lucas, take it away. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning for those in attendance. Uh, my name is Lucas Bobroff. I'm a Principal Data Architect at Pure Storage. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about how we can break you from ransomware jail with pure storage solutions. And it's very valuable for what you can do in both sides of the, the fence. You can look at it from our production storage as well as for what backup solutions usually enable you to get, but you, you are always are missing a certain feature in, in essence to deliver uh, a very fast recovery situation for your environment. So why, why should you care about ransomware these days. Generally speaking, there's no country that's immune to it. I mean, yes, there's certain where areas of the world that have firewalls and, and are situations that don't allow you to get access to the data that's potentially in the customer's environment. The challenging part is there's really no vertical that's getting uh, zero press for actually getting hit. You see like public school systems getting hit. You see hospitals becoming attacked. You see private organizations getting it impacted and losing customer trust due to the fact that they've been attacked in the long run. 
you've also seen over the years banks be hit. Uh, there's really no industry, no country, no one that can be immune in most cases for ransomware attacks that they've been hit by. And it's really leaving a huge impact from an organizational perspective because there's a lot of things that customers have to start to think about when they look towards solutions in their environment themselves. And the cost of ransomware has drastically gone up in most cases. It's accelerated because of the world we're in today. I mean, everyone's working from home. The cost of goods has tried, predominantly gone up, but generally the mechanism that ransomware is paid out by is the is Bitcoin in most cases. And, and it's driving, if you've ever looked at Bitcoin in, in years past, the price of Bitcoin has drastically gone up in the last two years. And that's a huge and easy mechanism for ransomware hackers to get paid by because it's something that they can do untraceably and they can actually have a timer set to it. And at that point, if you are if you don't pay the ransom, it doubles. And it's easy for them to do. You can have ransomware for higher services. There's really a lot of ways you can be impacted. And the cost of ransomware is really cumbersome for customers because it can attack someone that's really small from an organizational perspective or someone that's very large in the public stratosphere itself. So what can you do to help your business make sure it's not going to be impacted by ransomware and enable your business to progress your, your, yourself to get actually better in the long run. Backups are your last line of defense. If your data is encrypted, generally you have to go to your backups to restore your environment to an unencrypted state. Or you can pay and pray and hope that the ransomware attackers give you every last little bite of your data back in an unencrypted framework. Not every ransomware attacker is that nice. And the challenge is you have to really hope that you can do it. So most of the time you have to have a good backup workflow. And when you look at backup in general, ransomware has changed the priorities. So historically, the focus used to be, hey, I wanna have something that's easy. I want something that had give me choices. Something that had some advanced frameworks to it where I could back up some newer age technologies, something that caused uh, that allowed me to automate my backup workflows. And that was well and good for the last 20 years. It was something that enabled you to progress software wise in your organization, enabled you to progress um, as you started to roll out to the cloud, all those types of things that customers are starting to do from an organizational perspective. Now, when you look at what you need now, you need to start to focus on the recovery angle of it all you probably can't say that your data is shrinking from a size perspective. So what you were backing up five to 10 years ago has doubled in size, tripled in size, depending on how the organization has grown. So that restoration window that you were promising 10 years ago has changed in most cases, because in most environments themselves, the restoration speed has not changed. Recovery is the most paramount thing, but when you look at a business and they're offline, you need something that can actually recover at lightning speed. You have shorter SLAs to your business owners. They're saying, I want something online in an hour, two hours, and your solution is giving it in six, 10, 24 hours in some cases. A business cannot operate out without its data because you lose public trust, public trust being either an internal organization or public trust being externally with your consumer market itself. And then you also need something that has the portability nature of how backup needs to be deployed these days. In a lot of cases, customers are using cloud. In some cases, customers are using cloud in the effort of being their primary storage target for backup. That's not going to deliver a very fast recovery mechanism for your environment because you are limited to how your mechanism of getting that data back from a cloud vendor would be. So how long would it take to recover your data? It, and you have to think about these things. How critical is your data? What, where is your most critical data? Is it 50 terabytes? Is it 100 terabytes? Is it 150 terabytes? What are your applications? What are, how many patches have you been doing? Are you up to date? Do I need to do that after I do a recovery? How's your infrastructure? Is it something that can sustain a 50, 100, 150 terabyte write down from your backup solution and get it back online as soon as possible? And then there's always the, everything else that you try and think of. I mean, you're from a customer perspective, there's a lot of things you're trying to do in the security world. You're trying to protect your environment from firewalls, endpoint security, mobile device management. But when the cookie comes to crumble, you have an environment that 
you need to protect. And the best solution to protect your environment is good sustained backups that are protected in a nature that cannot be impacted from someone that gets access to the system. And did you know from, a, from an attack perspective that happened uh, last year, Colonial Pipeline allegedly paid the ransom after they discovered that re recovering from their backups would unfortunately take weeks or months to recover their full-on fledged environment itself to get back online. So when you look at that from, from your environment itself, if you had a workflow that would take weeks to months to come back online, how critical is that from the business perspective? How many man hours are you losing? How much money are you losing from a business perspective? And that's how you can start to justify in your head how we can start to procure something that can deliver a mechanism of recovery speed from an overall organization perspective. So how can we do this with Pure? From a, from a pure perspective, there's two key solution concepts. One would be simplicity and reliability of the data recovery mechanism. So you want something that's easy to set up, something that has a very simplistic daily operations schedule behind it. And then additionally, you wanna have something that has a very simplistic immutability angle to it. So at Pure, we, we talk about something called safe mode. That is our mechanism of protecting your data from administration deletion. So what that means is if there's a rogue administrator in your environment, whether that's ransomware attacker or someone that's a disgruntled employee, they don't have access to remove things off of your environment itself. And then two, you need something that can recover data at lightning speeds. You need to have that rapid recovery of your environment. I mean, when you talk to employees at your organization, you don't really recover a lot of things. You have a lot of other mechanisms to do recoveries database wise or other situations in, in the environment where you're not doing a recovery. But when you think about it, when's the last time you did a recovery of 100 terabytes or recovered your full stack? Yes, you may not have the production storage to deliver a recovery of your full stack, but that's what you have to start to consider. How long would it take me to recover my environment? And then you need to have backup vendor features. So there's a lot of backup software vendors out there in the stratosphere. There's a lot of vendors that do a lot of different features. There's the live mount capability that a lot of the vendors have started to deliver too, where the RTO is zero, but if you try and deliver that off of another storage solution that's potentially not all flash, your life of delivering live mounts off of that non-all flash storage is going to be slow. And then there's also other solutions that give explorers, those allow you to do zero day exploration off of the backups themselves and ensure that when you're doing your recovery, you're not going to have a situation where you're recovering ransomware data back into your environment. When you look at after an attack, there's generally speaking two things you need to have. You need to have valid data, which is really point number one. I mean, you need to have something that was safe before the attack really hit your environment itself. And then additionally, you need something that is as fast as possible for your environment to recover as much data as you can to get your business back online. Because in some cases, you may not know the extent of where your recovery needs to go. So you're like, oh, my application stacks five terabytes, but 20 terabytes of data that's in your environment was impacted too. And you need to clean that data up before you can bring it back online. And in some cases that 20 terabytes is critical from an internalized business perspective. It may not be customer facing from a consumer perspective. So when you look at ransomware attack mitigation, there's a couple things that you need to have. Before the attack, you need something that's simple. So, I mean, we at Pure Storage have solutions that are very simple to implement and operate with regards to production storage as well as backup solutions as well. Additionally, you need something that has the immutability from a, and while the attack is happening, you need to have something that's immutable and something that will protect you in case that rogue administrator gets access to the platform and starts to potentially delete things. And then again, once you look at it, hey, we're in a post-mortem situation after the attack, I need something that can recover as fast as possible. And you need to have something that has unmatched recovery speed for an environment itself. And there's lots of times when we talk to customers that we are the fastest thing. We move the puck from a recovery perspective somewhere else in the stack, either the network, the server infrastructure, or even the production storage that we're writing the solution to. So when you look at it from a first line of defense perspective, we, we at Pure Storage have two platforms predominantly, Flash Array and Flash Blade. Flash Array is the solution that we position production storage on most of the time for customers. And we enable you to do snapshots. 
A lot of customers use snapshots, although not enough customers use snapshots. Snapshots on a flash array are really fast, not cumbersome from a primary storage perspective. There's very little interruption for how you actually handle it, but it's very capable snapshots that you can deliver for other things that your customer environment needs. Maybe I'm doing a clone or anything else. The value of this is you can recover anything to anywhere. You can recover it to a primary storage target here, or if you're replicating it, you can use that same replicated snapshot to a different, different flash rate potentially. We allow you to use safe mode on a flash rate to protect those snapshots. The value of protecting these snapshots prevents the permanent loss of data. So if you are protecting your, your environment by way of snapshots, if someone comes in on the front side of an application, encrypts it, we still have a known good snapshot of the data because we actually had that copy before the attack happened. And then if they were to come in on trying to delete things on a flash array, they are not successful in purging it off of the box itself. And then again, you have the capability of doing a quick data restore. So, I mean, in some situations you can restore your environment in minutes, not hours, not days in some cases, or even months for some solutions that are out there. And this is included at no charge on a flash array and additionally no charge on a flash blade. So what happens when you use a flash blade from a solution set perspective? And I will say snapshots are not equivalent to backups in most cases, most cases for customers. What we try and deliver with snapshots on a flash array for a capability, it allows you to have quick restoration, ensure that you're not gonna have something that may be missed by your backup window and allows you to prevent your production storage from being deleted. What Flashblade can do with safe mode snapshots, we have integration efforts with lots of different backup software vendors and it allows us to protect our data due to admin, administrator mistakes, malicious attacks, and gives us those unalterable immutable file systems as well as we have an extrapolation to use that for Commvault with S3 as well. From a, from a deployment perspective, we can get amazing restoration speeds for customer environments that can be upwards of 270 terabytes per hour, which again, not many customer environments can write that down from a storage production wise, but we can stand behind that from a recovery mechanism perspective that allows you to know that your data will be back online as fast as humanly possible. And again, when we look at customer environments, as I said, about 50% of customers are probably using snapshots in most cases across the, across the deployment of all flash arrays for, for the install base. And when you look at how customers are trying to ensure that they're protected, we've added features to our monitoring and alerting tools. So Pure One is a software as a service solution delivered to customers at no charge. You basically have to have your box dial home and we are visualizing data back to you. And with this visualization, we can actually alert you to say, hey, if your box has safe mode turned on or not. And then additionally, we can check to see if volumes are protected with, with snapshots themselves. Are we meeting the RPOs? And again, are we deliver and how are we replicating the data in some cases uh, to a secondary flash array itself or tertiary flash array itself. When we look at the second line of defense from a flash blade perspective, there's a lot of software vendors out there. And there's a lot of software vendors out there that we don't know in some cases because there's always new ones popping up. I mean, Cohesity and Rubrik have been some of the most recent vendors that have been in this in the backup arena. But we've been partnering heavily over the last four plus years with a lot of the vendors you see here on the left side of the screen and delivering business outcomes with huge recovery at scale. So when we have customers that come to us, we have a hundred terabyte Oracle database. We can't back up and re restore that in a very efficient manner with any of our solutions in the back space. Flashblade is a solution that can beat any other solution out there in the market itself. You look at other solutions that are in the backup software space. So we're talking about a Commvault or a Veritas. We have tightly architected, tightly integrated deployments with both of those solutions themselves. And of course we have a integrated appliance deployment with Cohesity known as Flash Recovery Powered by Cohesity itself. So when you look at it from a 
hey, what can we do? What you want to ask yourself is, is your staff ready in the effort of, I need to stop an environment from being attacked by ransomware? How long would it take you to actually restore your critical systems in your environment? Is it going to be five hours, 10 hours, 12 hours, or even days or weeks? How much longer would it take to restore everything else? So say that was only five terabytes versus 100 terabytes. And then can your infrastructure support the recovery mechanisms that you're, you're trying to deliver? And what does your leadership expect you to do for recovery times? Are they expecting that things will be online in two hours? Well, in that case, you're not meeting the needs of what your executive staff potentially needs. And can you actually put your name on it and say that your current data protection meets the needs of what your solution is? And when you look at data protection these days, all flash was kind of a misnomer before. But nowadays, all flash for data protection has picked up steam because of the need of recovery speed. And from that angle, we've seen a lot of customers start to drive towards all flash for backup because they have all flash in their production storage. So they need to deliver a very fast recovery mechanism because this day and age, if you have something on your cell phone that takes five seconds to load, you don't actually go visit that application, web page, or whatever it may be. We're in a very different world these days where the world of instantaneous response is what you need, and that's the world that we deliver. And with that, we'll ask for any questions, uh, provide hopefully some answers to you, or also provide additional content on how we work with a lot of the different software vendors out there. Great presentation, Lucas. I really appreciate that. I learned a lot. I'm sure the audience did as well. We do have some questions for you. And while we take questions from the audience, I've just brought up this poll on the screen I want to call everyone's attention to. It says, what additional information would you like about the pure storage solution? And we appreciate your feedback on that. Uh, Lucas, you ready for some Q&A? Yep. Excellent. All right, let's see. First question I see here on the list, uh, I'll just start with this one. Uh, they're asking, is Flash faster than disk for recoveries? I think you answered that, but probably good to clarify. Yeah, yeah. So in a lot of cases, historically for backup solutions, disk was what a lot of vendors had chosen. And that's just due to cost economics in, in most cases. But this day and age, when you're dealing with production storage running on top of all flash storage, you need to have something that can deliver the same recovery speed that the business needs to get back online due to the demanding SLAs businesses have these days. And flash allows you to get back online faster than spinning disk does. Excellent. And then what about uh, preventing, you know, malicious attackers from corrupting the backup data that's stored in the pure storage array? Yeah. So in the presentation, I touched upon a function called safe mode that pure storage has offered for a number of years on the Flashboy product line. What that enables you to do, it allows you to protect your environment by taking a underlying snapshot on the platform and it allows you to have that in a protected manner that's not visible by hackers that potentially gain access to your overall environment itself and that allows you to have a known good copy so if they did corrupt the production backups whether that's through another piece of software they got access to that corrupted the the data that was in that original backup you have a known good state snapshot of backups that you can restore back to the file system and allow you to recover back through the application in question. Got it. Okay. And then next question here, uh, with pure storage, how quickly can I get back online after mm -hmm. I have a disaster? So a lot of that depends in, in, in most cases, but we're the fastest solution out there to get you back to your production storage environment out there. So in most cases, when you look at a lot of solutions that are out there, they can deliver live mount capability. There's another vendor that we that talked about this before us from a recovery mechanism perspective. But when, you, when you're trying to do a recovery in your environment that is of decent size, most customers need to restore a decent amount of data to get back online from a production application perspective. The value of getting it back online as soon as possible because we're, we live in a very instantaneous world. If something takes 15 seconds on your phone to load, you're not going to be doing that anymore on your phone. So if you have something that takes five hours to bring back to your production environment, you're losing business from your internalized customers or your externalized customers. 
So it, it really depends, but how quickly you can do it is as soon as possible, and Flashblade is the solution that can deliver as soon as possible. Um, hopefully based off of your production storage environment that we're recovering to. Because we're only as good as some of the uh, components that are part of the stack itself. Absolutely, yeah. Um, next question, can I recover from the cloud and what are the advantages or disadvantages? So a lot of customers uh, utilize cloud. Sometimes that's used in a mechanism of archival for backup, or in some situations there's backup solutions that write directly to cloud. Cloud is a great solution, although if you saw it today, AWS US West had an outage. I don't know if anyone was impacted by that. From an overall perspective, if you had to recover your environment and that was not accessible, well, then you were having a bad situation from a recovery mechanism. The best method from a customer perspective is your data is internalized to your environment. Long-term stuff that you don't recover most of the time that you don't really care about, you're caring about something that's within the last five days for your business to be in a no-good state. And that allows you to have something that's internal. Yes, you can have your long-term stuff out in the cloud, but you're not going to have a good mechanism to get that data back because in most situations from a internet-connected device that's going out to a cloud vendor for, for cheap storage, your internet connection is usually at, at the most 10 gig from a throughput perspective, so you're not going to be able to recover a sizable environment in a very time-sensitive manner. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, another question they want to know when it comes to sna taking snapshots of the data, I, I think you mentioned, is there a, a mechanism to prevent the snapshots from being deleted? And then also, is there any performance impact um, for keeping snapshots for a long period of time? So the mechanism of taking snapshots and is there a mechanism to delete them? Yes. Safe mode is the mechanism to prevent deletion of snapshots on the platform. Both FlashBlade and Flash Array have that from a mechanism that restricts administration access. So that's either API, CLI, or UI-driven calls to delete snapshots on the platform. And snapshots are in a read-only framework, and there's no performance impact when you take a snapshot on the platform. We're just doing uh, reads. We, we have no challenge for taking a snapshot on the platform itself. Okay. And this is a good one from Eric. He wants to know, does Pure offer an as-a-service model? So yes, Pure offers an as-a-service model. We've been doing it for a number of years. It's called Pure as a Service. Uh, we have a number of different styles of offering. We partner with a lot of, uh, we, we started to partner with Bare Metal as a Service Framework. So Equinix Metal is a solution that we can deliver Pure as a Service on if you have a, a need to be cloud adjacent or if you don't want to have your own data center anymore. That allows you to de deliver that in a, consumable manner in a cloud-like manner itself, but we also have the capability of delivering hardware to a customer's data center or colo and do that as a consumption-based model from a customer perspective. Nice, nice. Um, let's see, it looks like that's all the time we have here in our live Q&A session. There's a, still a ton more questions there for you, Lucas, in the electronic queue. Maybe you can get back to some of those folks. Uh, after the event here or during the event, if possible, um, because there's a lot of great questions and we appreciate those from the audience. But uh, Lucas, it's been great having you on the Megacast today. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And thank you to Pure Storage for supporting the Megacast today. Check out the link that's available there in your handouts tab. That'll take you to purestorage.com. And there's a, just a ton of resources available there on Flash Array, Flash Blade, uh, pure as a service and more. So make sure that you check out those resources and there's a link right at the homepage there to contact Pure Storage and get pricing or get started. And I like this comment here from Harold who said, uh, we are a Pure Storage customer and they are awesome. So thank you, Harold, for sharing that. It's always good to hear feedback, uh, hopefully good, about uh, all of the you know, solutions that we have featured here on our Megacast event series. So thank you for that. All right, if you haven't answered the poll question on the screen, I encourage you to do it now because I'm going to hand it over to Mr. Scott Becker from Actual Tech Media to announce our next prize winners. Scott? Thank you, David, and uh, great job so far. This has been a fantastic event. 
and uh, looking forward to, uh, to to the remaining uh, sessions. We really have some good stuff lined up as well. So as David said, I'm going to announce our next round of prize winners. So our third gift card is for Pradeep Sanjiria from Texas. And the, the next grand prize, the Apple M1 24-inch iMac, goes to Clint Rankin of Oklahoma. So Pradeep and Clint, congratulations. We'll be in, in touch about uh, claiming your prize. And with that, I'm delighted to bring on our next speaker. So we have Ann Blanchard, Senior Director of Product and Customer Marketing at Nasuni. Ann, welcome to the Megacast, and uh, take it away. Scott, thank you for having me. Can you hear me okay? I can. Okay, terrific. Well, thanks, everybody. It's great to be here uh, with all of you this afternoon or this morning, depending on your zone. Um, I want to talk today about the value of um, Nasuni's rapid ransomware recovery, but really to fit it into the bigger theme of today, which is how do you think about your overall recovery um, you know, posture as you go into 2022. Um, so lots of great speakers here today and great solutions. And I think we're all aware that ransomware is happening. It's, as many folks have said, its inevitability is uh, pretty clear. It's going to hit each of our organizations at one time or another. In fact, uh, ransomware is actually happening about every 10 or 11 seconds right now across the country. And what we see at Nasuni is it's it's really it's a C level concern because it's a it impacts the entire business and the confidence that your customers have in you, as well as your as as well as your workers. Um, one of the things about ransomware that's kind of unique as compared with disasters is that a lot of companies get hit more than once, and we've really we'll we'll get into that with some of our customer examples. But um, once particularly you've shown a, a vulnerability in some way, God forbid, um, there is this tendency to get hit again and again and again. And it also depends on the nature of the business. Um, businesses that are very customer-facing, that are serving up lots of data on a frequent basis or very transactional are, you know, especially uh, vulnerable to ransomware because uh, the attackers know they can't afford to be down uh, even for a few hours. So ransomware is kind of a recurring threat. It's not just a one-time threat uh, in the way that we used to think about um, losing files for backup or a disaster. Uh, and I think, you know, if we try to simplify it a little bit, um, there's really three pieces of the overall um, strategy against ransomware. One, of course, is prevention, trying to keep up that outer perimeter uh, as best we can with, with frequent you know, software patches and updates and all the great defense tools that are out there. Uh, secondly, detecting the attacker once it comes in. And of course, that is really the challenge, is knowing when you've been hit or when something is um, lying latent on your existing systems. And then the theme of today, which is uh, recovery. And uh, recovery can be um, a way of surviving even the worst ransomware attack uh, if you can, in a sense, get back to business as usual as quickly as possible and you know that you can get back to business and that, that is a key um, element here. If you know you can get back to business as usual as quickly as possible, uh, the pressure to pay the ransomware or go down that route, which can be very perilous in and of itself, uh, is much less. So. Let's um, talk about where Nasuni fits into that whole um, strategy. Nasuni is a cloud file services company. We store files, we share files, we synchronize files, we protect backup files and provide uh, both disaster recovery and ransomware mitigation. So we're a total cloud file services solution. Um, but what we're going to talk about today is where we fit in the, in the ransomware sort of architecture, which is we really have a very rapid recovery capability for your file shares. And um, in that, we fit right alongside, you know, some of our partners like Veronis, which does a terrific job at detecting 
ransomware attacks and scoping them. So we have a great integration with them uh, and some of the other vendors uh, like StealthBits uh, that play as part of the bigger strategy. But our real strength that we want to talk about today is um, using this overall file services as part of your ransomware recovery strategy. So architecturally, uh, Nisuni is a cloud object storage solution, and uh, every file and file change is stored in immutable object storage as an immutable object in object storage. Uh, so even the smallest changes to any file, any change whatsoever gets changed as an immutable object in cloud file storage. So right there we meet one of the, one of the really core criteria for using a cloud solution for ransomware recovery. Everything that goes into Nasuni essentially uh, is encrypted by uh, Nasuni software and becomes immutable. So the key thing is to get it, get it up into the cloud and get the changes um, all saved. Um, Secondly, the number of snapshots that's enabled by the fact that Nasuni is a cloud solution is essentially unlimited. So customers can save snapshots going back a years. They can save it essentially an infinite number of snapshots. We don't have limits um, imposed by either hardware architecture or disk capacity or tape capacity or any sort of um, time um, constraints. And that's actually a, a really good advantage our customers have come to rely on. Um, at, as far as a recovery mechanism, uh, we use something called Fast File Restore, which is built into our overall um, design, which allows customers to dial back to the version of the file or set of files uh, a few minutes before the attack and essentially click on that, and we're going to demonstrate that in a few minutes and uh, restore them in just a matter of minutes. What that does um, is give customers a very current uh, recovery point objective, and um, it also allows them to be very surgical in terms of what they recover. We, we all know that uh, going back and just basically restoring everybody to one level of data is great, but if in doing so we've erased hours and hours of productivity, particularly of um, you know, software designers or any kind of um, IP that we've been working on over the last eight to 10 hours, that's a loss for the business too. So it really helps to be very surgical in terms of what files you can restore and um, just targeting those for your recovery strategy. So in this slide, what we're showing is that uh, once you have identified those files, uh, the recovery with Nasuni is extremely fast. When you compare that with cloud backup and with traditional backup, we can talk, we're can talking about differences that can amount to hours or even days. Now, as I said, Nasuni is a cloud file services solution. However, we make use of edge caching, which eliminates um, the, the latency that people associate with cloud file storage. Uh, and in fact, we have about a 98 to 99% hit rate on that, on that cached uh, file storage that's local. So what that does is make sure that end users are not really impacted by any sort of cloud latency. The impact on RPOs and RTOs is significant, um, but the key thing here is that customers know what it is. And uh, we all know when you get that call from the CISO, uh, you know, how quickly can we be back up after this ransomware attack? Uh, it's important to have some sort of time frame and to, to hopefully know what that is. So um, in terms of knowing how quickly you can restore the files once you've identified the corrupted files, Nasuni gives our customers that sort of um, certainty and confidence. There is a lot of work in identifying the scope of an attack uh, no question about that. And what we find is that particularly when attacks are across multiple sites and large amounts of data, um, that can take customers a, a significant amount of time. Uh, but they have to factor that into the answers that they give their CISO and to their executives. But basically, they know that the recovery time, the restore time for the files themselves uh, is going to be very reliable uh, with a solution like this. So as I mentioned before, you know, being able to recover quickly is um, a, a 
a posture, if you will, against the attackers. And we, we have customers that are sometimes attacked as often as three times a week because they're in a very transactional business and they're just recovering and moving on and recovering and moving on. One uh, one customer we have that's willing to you know talk about their ex experience of like we've heard some examples uh, previously today is Leo Daly. Leo Daly is a, a globally recognized architecture engineering uh, firm, uh, and the key thing here is that it operates over multiple sites. The company um, has been in business for more than 100 years, and it's expanded and grown uh, so that it has multiple locations, all to service customers and projects. Uh, well, they were hit with a ransomware attack several years ago, but their file shares uh, were on the SUNY. And once they identified the files that had been corrupted, they restored um, uh, 130 terabytes uh, in less than an hour. And I'm going to do a demonstration of that in just a few minutes. Um, they also used Nasuni on a regular basis as essentially their backup solution because uh, they're taking infinite, you know, they're taking snapshots every few minutes into the cloud, and so they're able to restore those snapshots very quickly if they need to restore a file. And for them, that's eliminated a significant amount of infrastructure and cost around traditional backup uh, for their file share for their file share protection. Uh, when we'd gone out and surveyed customers about this experience, um, what they've said to, back to us is, you know, files were encrypted, uh, we restored, we were back, we were basically back to business. And once we identified the files that were effect, affected, um, we were back to business. This is, this is typically an operation that can take hours, if not days, to restore back from tape or traditional media. Uh, and so it's very, very um, significant impact to productivity to basically be able to say, hey, we're not going to take hours or days. We're going to restore these files in a matter of minutes once we've identified the ones that have been hit. What we've done uh, as part of showing the, the SUNY rapid ransomware recovery capability is we've created a demo. And uh, we're going to play that for you in just a, just a second here. But again, to describe architecturally what's happening here, uh, customers store uh, their files on the SUNY file shares in the cloud. They're immutable. Uh, they are um, retrievable through edge appliances that provide edge caching. Snapshots are done as frequently as the customer wants those snapshots to be taken. All changes get, sta get uh, saved to the cloud as an immutable changes in an immutable object store. Uh, when we will go through the, the recovery process here, once you've identified the files that have been impacted, uh, it's simply a matter of really moving a dial in the cloud, if you will, and you're back to a nice a clean set of files restored right up until a few minutes uh, before the attack itself takes place. Uh, so with that, as, as an introduction, I'm going to um, turn this over to the video, and we'll just see a quick demonstration here. Hi, this is Matt Stack, Solutions Architect at Nasuni. In this video, I'm going to demonstrate just how quick and easily you can recover either from a ransomware attack or any other type of outage with Nasuni. Now, what you'll see is first, I have a folder here called RW Data. This folder is a petabyte in size, has almost a million and a half files. Now, if I were to be hit by ransomware at any location, I have the ability from that single pane of glass management console to come in and select any site that I wanted. I'm going to keep my primary, as well as using the SUNY's continuously versioning file system to go in and select any previous version that I wanted. So if I just were to say, let's go back to 8.47 AM, uh, you can see there's my RW Data folder and I'm going to say restore. I already renamed it so I'm going to restore this and start the counter. Now again using the continuously versioning file system I can go back to any point in time that I want you know with a completely immutable unlimited number of snapshots and then this gives me the ability to select very surgically what I want to recover whether it be either an individual file a folder or you know the entire volume in its entirety.
And as soon as you're able to recover this content so quickly, because all we're doing is basically recreating pointers back into the object storage. With the traditional backup, you'd never be able to accomplish this because you have to go back and copy all of that content from some alternative media back to the primary. So as you can see here in 25 seconds, I was able to restore that content. Let's take a quick look. There you see that RDB data folder and all of the files that are in there. Again, you just saw me recover a petabyte of data, over a million files in a matter of seconds. And as soon as it gives you the best recovery point objectives with full unlimited immutable file versions, so you never have to worry about losing data or ever paying that ransom should you ever be hit by ransomware. If you have any questions, please reach out to us here at Nasuni. Thanks. Okay, so that was that was a demonstration of the restore uh, capabilities and the speed of the restore uh, for just over a petabyte of, of files there uh, that were stored in the SUNY. Um, what I want to mention is that uh, we're seeing as much as 80% of corporate data is out there on file shares. So uh, typically that data is not all in one place. It's stored in multiple locations uh, in file servers that may be in the corner office or uh, in data centers. And so what Nasuni does particularly well is provide a ransomware and backup solution and a storage solution for those multi-site types of configurations where people are, where companies are storing data across multiple locations and sharing that data across multiple locations. And that can be particularly troublesome uh, to recover from if you're hit with a ransomware attack across multiple locations, across multiple sets of data. Once you consolidate it in the SUNY, however, uh, you've got a centralized place and a centralized place to do the kind of restore that we've just seen. So uh, with that, I see we've got a couple of questions and I will open up um, to questions. Scott, if that's all right. Uh, and yep. let's see what what questions are coming into us from the audience here. Okay, yeah, that sounds great. Uh, and really nice presentation. By the way, I I do want to say how much I appreciate when when somebody does the uh, you know how how we're part of a complete breakfast uh, that slide and that that section explaining where Nasuni fits with uh, with other elements of a of a you know ransomware and disaster recovery <laughs> uh, protection plan is is uh, much appreciated. <laughs> That's um, right. We're, we're part of the big, bigger picture. <laughs> uh, first question here: How do you differentiate a robust backup strategy from a, a ransomware recovery strategy? Oh, that's that's a great question. So, you know, a, ro a backup strategy, of course, is designed to have completeness and uh, be there for all of your data, and um, to al allow restores, but hopefully not on a you know, sort of continuous basis. A ransomware strategy has to be able to restore extremely quickly uh, and also preferably be repeatable uh, for that specific data that, you, that you're trying to protect. I mean, we're, ne we're never going to not need backup uh, in the sense that we're not going to need a immutable copy of our data somewhere separate from production area. But ransomware really needs to be able to recover that data super quickly and a lot faster than traditional backup has been designed to do. Um, traditional backup offers integrity and um, completeness, but the rapid restore capability is really where it's fallen down. I think that's something that Gartner's pointed out and other analysts firms have, have pointed out when they've started to look at this problem. So ransomware recovery has to focus on speed um, and predictability as opposed to sort of thoroughness uh, and, and completeness. Okay, great. Uh, next question comes from Rob, who's asking, are there any snapshot directory or, or other limits to your object storage? No. Uh, this is where the cloud uh, is, you know, uh, delivers its magic, if you will. Um, you know, the cloud is so scalable, and the SUNY's architected uh, in the cloud. It's not architected around a controller uh, limitation or hardware limitation. 
And so you can build an unlimited number of directories uh, and an unlimited number of snapshots if you so choose to do that. Uh, we do have a, a customer with over a million snapshots of their data going back several years right now. Um, because of the scalability of the cloud, customers can do that. So no, so no limits is the answer to the question. Okay. And and you said uh, a customer has over a million uh, snapshots. So so Richard asked a question. It's almost a, a direct follow up to to this last one, which is, uh, how can you have an unlimited number of snapshots, and is that a best practice? Um, any thoughts there? On is it is it a good idea generally to have a million snapshots or? It really it's very it depends on the customer. We we do help customers with what we call pruning, uh, because there are you know customers don't necessarily want a million versions of their <laughs> of their data. Uh, some <laughs> customers don't care, <laughs> uh, but some do, and they you know particularly when they get further back in time, they just kind of want you know one or two check in points to make sure that they've got complete copies at specific points of time, and we help customers develop a strategy for that. Uh, but for you know more near term, a lot of customers like the fact they can just kind of let it run and not have to worry at six months or sixty days or whatever their limits might be today. Uh, oh my gosh, I've got to go back and make sure that you know I do a complete backup at this point. They they can just let it run until they're ready to do the pruning or make a decision about what to get rid of. Okay, super. Um, we did have several. Uh, members of the audience confirming that they've been with with Nasuni uh, for several years. Uh, Danielle says several years. Uh, totally agree with the recovery speed. They mentioned the demo video, um, and uh, and and Scott also liked the uh, the video or the uh, the demo. Um, the question here uh, comes from Yuriv. He's asking, how can you make sure your snapshots are not deleted? Uh, well, if if I'm sorry if I'm not following the, the question perfectly, but if what the question is driving at is um, the, the customer certainly can decide to eliminate snapshots if they want to, uh, but ransomware um, snapshots, you know, that goes; those are in the cloud; those are immutable. That that would not. That would not be possible so far as the the way you know Nasuni works in terms of eliminate you know going in and deleting backups unless they were, got control of Nasuni in some way, which we don't you know we haven't seen that yet. Right. That would have to okay. be kind of an inside. That would kind of have to be like an insider type situation where somebody on the inside deleted snapshots or an administrator. Super. Um, and I do want to mention, I did just put the, the poll up. If you'd like more information uh, about Nasuni, you can, you can select there what, what you'd like to, to hear about in terms of, uh, of resources. Uh, and another question for you, a lot of cloud vendors talk about immutability. What's, what's different about how Nasuni protects data in the cloud uh, compared to some, some other concepts of immutability or, or I guess implementations of immutability? Well, yes. I think what's different is the granularity at which we offer the immutability. Like I said, it's down to one to five minute snapshots. Um, so it's not just at the file level or the complete backup level. Uh, every single change becomes an immutable object, uh, which is a little hard for people to Sort of grasp in the beginning because they're they're used to sort of doing backups on a regular basis in big chunks, uh, but in this case, every change becomes an immutable object, which gives the system kind of a durability as well as an immutability. Um, and that's that's one change. And then the other the other um, factor is that it's no good having all this data in the cloud if you can't access it locally at a speed that your users you know, can can benefit from. So we put edge caching in as part of our architecture, and that's really what delivers sort of the land speed reco recovery. As soon as the file is restored, 
customers can call it into their cache and then they're using it at the normal speed that they're used to off of their LAN server. Okay, great. Um, probably have time for one more question. How is ransomware recovery capability starting to impact companies' uh, cyber insurance strategies? <laughs> well, that's a big question. I think ransomware is sort of a subset of, of cybersecurity. It's a, it's a great question. We're seeing probably what, what a number of folks are on this um, webinar are seeing, is, which is that insurance companies are raising the rates and also turning a lot of companies down um, for ransomware uh, insurance, which can impact your ability to get new customers. Uh, it's, it's, it can be very painful. So I think what's important for all of us on this, this call is to realize if we're proactive in, in establishing a protection strategy and a recovery strategy that's predictable as possible, we're going to put our own companies in a better position to negotiate those insurance rates to show the recovery um, and to keep the insurance policies you know, overall, which is really the threat is that insurance companies will get out of this business. Um, so it's, it's important to be proactive with a, with a strategy of recovery as well as prevention and detection. Uh, and, and as IT leaders, that's really what we, what we need to do going forward into 2022. Well, Anne, thanks very much for your, your time today. We, we do have a lot more questions from the audience, but unfortunately we're, we're up on time. Um, appreciate the, Thank you, uh, Scott. Yeah, the update on, on the SUNY. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And with that, we're going to move on to our next prize drawing. So the next $500 Amazon gift card goes to uh, Crystal, Osoy from New Jersey. And the next grand prize, Apple M1 24 inch iMac, goes to Nelson Perez of Massachusetts. So, congratulations to Crystal and Nelson. And with that, I would like to bring on our next speaker. I'm pleased to introduce George Crump, who's Chief Marketing Officer at Store One. George, welcome. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you letting me join. Yeah, take it away. Okay, thank you. So uh, I'm George Crump. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at Store One. Prior to joining Store One, I was uh, founder and lead analyst at a storage analyst firm called Storage Switzerland. Uh, but my experience with backup goes all the way back to the uh, late 80s. And in the early 90s, I joined a company called Legato. Uh, and so we've been dealing with this uh, for quite some time. Uh, I, what Store One brings to the table is something that I think is important as we kind of look at the title 2022 and data protection and disaster recovery. And so I'm going to take you through that very quickly and uh, feel free to ask questions. Uh, what we are is uh, we have a product called S1 Backup uh, that is designed specifically to enhance existing backup applications to help with things like ransomware. But there's going to be more things to worry about in 2022 than just ransomware. So we address a lot of different things here. Uh, and so I'll take you through that. Uh, just some quick background on Store One, because we may not be as familiar as other companies uh, to you. We are a storage software company. We focus primarily on software. Well, unlike most companies, we were, our first eight years, we were locked in, focused on developing and rewriting storage algorithms. Our focus is to be very efficient uh, with the hardware that you're giving us. Uh, both in terms of utilizing it to deliver performance and running at high capacities. Uh, so we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, the, the, the product is so flexible that it can cover a broad range of solutions, but most customers start using us in the backup use case. Uh, and if you look at the kind of the challenges, I think obviously everybody knows these, uh, but you know, backup costs are increasing. Uh, there's this little thing called ransomware. I don't know if you've heard of it. Uh, it might have been mentioned a couple of times today. Uh, and it's, but the difference now is it's specifically targeting backup data. We have uh, multiple instances of that occurring. And backup data, uh, backup storage is pretty uh, vulnerable. Um, you know, and, and most people look at backup as their insurance policy. It's the thing you go to for last resort. Um, 
and, and really, the, if you look at the software products that are on the market today compared to, say, when I was uh, doing this in the early 90s, the innovation from the software side has been incredible. Uh, the problem is the, the backup storage targets themselves just aren't keeping pace, and customers are kind of forced or they don't see any particular value in just you know, going and getting a high-capacity NAS or something like that. So if you look at that innovation, um, it, you know, mo modern backup software has all the capabilities to solve the problem, including ransomware and things like that. You know, you can do a lot of backups very, very qu quickly now, thanks to incremental backup forever uh, type of technologies, change block tracking, block level incrementals. Um, you can. Uh, there, a lot of the products have done a very good job with ransomware detection, letting you know there's some malware in your in your backups. Um, it was mentioned a couple times, the concept of what I call uh, data in place recovery or being able to instantiate VMs and applications on your backup uh, device uh, it certainly exists. And then all these products have gotten very good at long-term retention too, so the, the ability to use this as you know, fundamentally an archive uh, certainly exists uh, in the market. The, the challenge though, as we look at uh, some of the benefits there, is it, this should improve your RPO. You should be able to really provide a ransomware-proof environment. If, you, if you're going to count on backups for recovery, you've got to be able to make sure that this is viable. Uh, you should be able to really uplift and get out of the insurance policy mode with, with uh, data in place recovery and really game change the recovery time objectives. And then you, know, you should be able to use this retention area as a long-term uh, data mining and compliance vehicle. So, uh, you know, but the, the challenge that we see is because of the, um, the backup storage, it just has put a big roadblock in place here. Uh, you know, the, the, um, the systems are, are using very slow, hard disk drive technology for ingest. They can't maintain the pace. Um, they, they really don't provide any or, or it's very restricted in the immutability. Uh, immutability, as you've heard a couple of times, is critical here. Uh, the, uh, again, as was mentioned earlier, the ability to restore uh, and have that restore performance look similar to what production looks like is critical. If you're in an all-flash environment or a hybrid environment and you're trying to recover uh, and instantiate VMs on the hard disk drives that are probably burdened with deduplication and compression, the chances of getting anything close to uh, decent performance is, is really low. Uh, and, and then the, 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 but the other problem is on the back end, and when you start talking about retention, uh, I don't know if you really want to restore, uh, store all that data on flash for 10, 10 years, right? The, it, it's, it's still 10x more expensive uh, than hard disk technology. And so to blend these and use them uh, appropriately is really what we focused on with uh, our product. And so it provides instant immutability. It has a backup opti optimized flash tier, and I'll explain what that means. Uh, and then it provides an incredibly uh, powerful total cost of ownership, very, very low cost. Um, now, it, what we really have to do is really elevate backup software, right? Backup software is, it, we have to allow it to really tap into its full potential. And so let's talk about a couple of things. So when we talk about ransomware and really any type of recovery, the, the, one of the key things is that recovery point objective. So this is the window between capture events. You want to make sure that you're capturing data as frequently as possible. And the software, again, gives you the ability to do that. The problem is, again, the storage gets in the way. Uh, the, the hard disk only tier, if it's a hard disk only system, uh, becomes a bottleneck. You just can't ingest data. We have customers now doing hundreds of jobs uh, every five to ten minutes. Uh, that the, the hard disk system just can't keep up. We've thinned the size of the backup, but we've increased the number of backups and their frequency. Uh, so as a result of that, you just can't do those backups as frequently as you want to, and then that or leaves you exposed. Uh, also, none of this data in, in, in the typical appliance that we see in the market today is stored in an immutable state, which means it's totally vulnerable to a ransomware attack. What, what S1 Backup does, the first layer of it is a flash tier that you can adjust uh, in size. Uh, it needs to be, you should size it certainly big enough to handle your, your hourly or whatever your, uh, your flash, your backup sizes are. Uh, but most of our customers will extend it uh, beyond that, and I'll explain why in a second. Uh, now, what we did, remember I said we were focused on being efficient. And what we have done was by rewriting key storage algorithms 
is we're able to run Flash hardware at its maximum level of performance. If you look at the raw performance of drive, most systems, production or otherwise, just can't extract the full performance from those drives. We can. And so on eight drives, we're delivering hundreds of thousands of IOPS, and that becomes critical when we start talking about these uh, high-frequency uh, high backup jobs that we're dealing with. So on just eight flash drives, uh, we can sustain hundreds of uh, backup jobs on an ongoing basis. Uh, so that allows you to really increase your frequency. Uh, you can do those backups as often as you want to. Uh, and more, most importantly, every single backup job is immutable. It can't be uh, altered or changed in any way. You set the retention and the, the immutability time. And so all of that is controlled uh, by you. So it, it can't be uh, altered. Now the next thing is to really enable incremental forever backup, which is really the basis of change block and block level incremental backups. And there's a kind of a dirty little secret when we get into incremental forever backups is the there's a, at some point you need to do this thing called a consolidation job where you take all these incrementals, merge them with the full that started the whole thing, and create a new synthetic or virtual full. Uh, the problem is, is again, with a hard drive-based system, the time it takes to do all that is longer than the time it takes to do another full backup job. But of course, doing another full backup job has its own issues, so it's sort of a catch-22. What we've done is, again, with that flash tier, because it runs at such high performance, is we can uh, very, very quickly interleave these incrementals and fulls together, creating a net new uh, virtual or synthetic full. Uh, we do it about 10x faster than anything else on the market. Then we automatically move that uh, old full backup down to the hard disk tier. So yes, we're not uh, flash only, we're flash first, and we, we really like hard drives, and I'll explain why in a second. So this, but these two uh, capabilities here that, this, that are powered by this flash tier enable you to do very, very frequent backups and to uh, be able to merge them into new synthetic or virtual fulls uh, very, very quickly. So you can keep pace, uh, and then the, the next step is to really push that to the hard drive tier to, to keep it cost effective. Because remember, most recoveries, even in a ransomware attack, tend to come from the last, uh, the last backup, or in worst case, the last few days backup. So uh, that becomes critical uh, as well. So the other thing, though, is as you respond to a ransomware request, you're kind of in a, a little bit of a uh, race. You know, your, your CFO might be very tempted to pay the ransom because, in theory, you pay the ransom and everything's done. Of course, there's many uh, documented cases now where the, uh, the bad guys don't actually uh, honor their word and give you the code, so you've got to be a little careful with that. Uh, but you do have to get this thing recovered pretty quickly. And remember, your environment has fundamentally been, uh, you know, compromised, right? And so the, the nice thing is what we've created here is a clean tier of storage. There's no uh, corruption here. We've been using immutability the whole time. Uh, but the problem is you can't leverage your hard drive system to do that because uh, you can't deliver the performance that you want uh, off of that tier. So what we do with S1 Backup is, again, we leverage that flash tier, and we can deliver production class performance. As I said, with eight tries, we're getting hundreds of thousands of IOPS. Um, you can uh, then basically deliver near production performance, take your time in recovering uh, back into the production system, make sure you've really removed everything, you've got everything straight. Uh, you can run in production on, on the S1 Backup system for as long as you need to. As you can see there in the picture, uh, there's, two, there's two nodes. It's highly available. It's delivering high performance. Uh, it supports all the different protocols. You can run either in the recovered state that the backup software uh, provides to you, or you can recover raw and just run natively right off of the solution. So either way uh, is totally acceptable to us. So all of that is uh, about the flash tier and how we leverage it. The, the next big thing that I think is left out in these conversations is you do have to be able to afford this thing. And so, and you also typically are wanting to retain data for a longer and longer period of time. The, the good news is the technology to do that exists, and it's not deduplication. It's high-density hard drives. The, within weeks, Seagate uh, will be delivering a 20-terabyte uh, hard drive to market 
Western Digital and Toshiba will be soon to, soon to follow. The problem is, is that when I say 20 terabyte hard drives to people, the first thing they think about is the last RAID rebuild they had to go through that took them three or four days, and they think, well, geez, a 20 terabyte hard drive, that's going to take three or four weeks, right? So that's the, the RAID rebuild thing is top of mind for everybody. The other thing we see typically, especially in backup stores, but even in production, is very low utilization of the technology. It, the data placement algorithms are are not uh, very good, and so they need free, lots of free space to be able to effectively write data uh, and keep pace. Uh, we, we don't need that, and I'll explain why in a second. Uh, the other big one which is surprising to me is you can't mix drive sizes. And if you can, you have to create either new volumes or new LUNs, which especially in the backup uh, space creates problems because now you have to reschedule and retarget uh, backup jobs. So what we do that's a, a little different here is, so we very much focused on algorithms that relate to hard disk drives. We didn't think they were going to die. We thought that the hard disk vendors would continue to innovate, and they, they are, right? And so what we've done is very specific. Uh, in addition to the stuff we've done to enhance flash performance, we've also done a lot of stuff to enhance a hard drive utilization. Uh, so first of all, we can run at 90% uh, capacity utilization. So if you have a petabyte of storage, you can use over 900 terabytes of it. With many competing solutions, you probably can only run at about 600 terabytes of it. You've got to have that free space. So that's a huge advantage for us. You get more out of the, the capacity you're paying for. Probably the big one, though, is our RAID rebuild technology. We, we rewrote and restructured um, key algorithms to be able to deliver very, very high uh, performance during a rebuild. Uh, and that performance comes in two forms. Number one, we can deliver uh, very high uh, performance uh, in during the rebuild, so inbound backups and things like that are not um, impacted. And then number two, the actual recovery itself is very fast. So where a typical system might take days to do recovery, we've done testing already with 18 terabyte drives, and we're seeing recoveries of those systems within less than three hours. There's a video on our site uh, that you can look at that we show that happening. Um, and we expect very much the same uh, performance with 20 terabyte drives as well. So that, that makes, you know, it's one thing to be able to plug a 20 terabyte drive in your system. It's another thing to use it in a practical fashion. And we think we've uh, accomplished that with the technology. Probably the other big one is our ability to allow you to grow, right? We, what we do know about hard drives, just like flash drives, is that they're going to increase in density over the next uh, few years, right? That, uh, as I said, 20 terabyte drives we expect in January for sure. Uh, we expect something in the uh, 25 terabyte range, uh, 22 to 25 terabyte range before the end of 2022, and we expect to continue to scale up in that environment as well. Uh, with our technology, you can mix drives into our system, yet still present the same volume. So you know, backup to me is the ultimate set and forget. I don't want to go in and mess with backup jobs if I don't have to. Uh, this allows you to start with a shelf of 18 terabyte drives, add 20 terabyte drives, add 22 terabyte drives, and the, the same volume is presented to the backup, uh, backup software, and you don't have to change anything on your end, but you still use the full capacity. Uh, so popular is this that most of our customers buy half full uh, shelves so that next year or the year after when they need to upgrade, they literally just drop in drives. They don't need to worry about cables or anything like that. So uh, all of that's uh, available to you. So if you look at this from a uh, solution standpoint, again, again, we'll come back to where we started, right? Look, look at the capabilities of uh, modern backup software. What we do is we unleash this, we think. Uh, first of all, our, flat, our flash first ingest allows you to do, truly do incremental backups, do them as often as you want to, not have to worry about consolidation jobs. Um, we can, you know, the, with, the, uh, with the ransomware detection built into the backup software, we can deliver backup immutability, so we don't have to worry about uh, crossover. One other point on the immutability, by the way, is that is across all protocols. So we don't force you to switch to like an S3 object store or push data to the cloud or anything like that. All the backups are immutable. Uh, third, we provide that, that same, we use that same flash tier for recovery. We automatically uh, resize it based on what's the pressing need at the moment in time. Uh, so we use it again there. 
And then uh, we're very intelligent in our use of high-density drives. We can deliver very fast rebuilds. We can use them at their full capacity. So again, what we've done is really, uh, we've really gotten out of the way of the backup software. Let the guys that are writing this incredible code uh, really innovate. So best possible recovery point objective, 100% ransomware proof environment. Uh, the software and the combination really delivers almost a standby storage environment. We've had customers run uh, for days because their production storage system uh, went down, uh, run for days on our system. Uh, and then we deliver with, with retention. It's all about data integrity and affordability. Uh, I talked about the use of 20 terabyte high drive, hard drives. Uh, we also auto detect uh, any media failures, bit error rots, silent data corruption, all of that stuff is uh, also uh, already uh, taken care of. So uh, that, uh, that wraps it up for me. Uh, do we have any questions? Yeah, we sure do. Um, and uh, great presentation, George. I appreciate the, uh, the the flash first, not not flash only. Um, makes a lot of sense. So before we get started with the questions, I do want to put up the the poll question. Um, just about any information that you'd like about the the Store One solution. So if you can fill that out, um, be sure to uh, be able to get you uh, what you were interested in. So yeah, George, we did have a a lot of questions rolling in here. Um, First one comes from Bradford. He's wondering if if Store One provides an on-prem in cloud solution or, or hybrid. Um, is is this mostly on-prem, or are there are there hybrid elements to it? Uh, th there are hybrid elements to it, so you can uh, run it in, in. We are fundamentally, as I said, software, so we can instantiate uh, on-prem on uh, you know uh, two controllers. Uh, you can provide them or we can provide them, whatever you're most comfortable with. Uh, in either case, we provide 100% support on it, and we can do the same thing uh, in, clou in cloud. We, I can, if anybody's interested in a demo, I can show you it running in, say, for example, an Azure instance or an AWS instance. Okay. Um, another question, you talked about the, uh, the, the mixing and, and matching um, and, and Brad of, of the of the drives and, and Bradford has a mm -hmm. question there. Um, you know, does it support growth for the foreseeable future as far as the controllers and the firmware, firmware, or or you know, will people sort of outgrow their their solution and need to replace it? Yeah, that's a great question. So the way we try to describe it is, we're a platform company. We want to be in place for uh, you know over a decade, if not longer. And so the mixing of drives is critical, uh, right, because you're going to be adding those probably as time goes on. Uh, but then at some point you probably are going to want to do a controller upgrade. Uh, and that's totally seamless. Uh, we, we think most customers uh, today will be starting with a PCIe Gen 4 platform, but you could start with a PCIe Gen 3 platform. Uh, we have those. Uh, and then you can transition to the next generation platform uh, seamlessly, non-disruptive, with no data migration uh, at any time. Um, it's generally, you notice I pushed the uh, concept of the platform itself, uh, the, the motherboard. It's not really the processor. Again, because of our focus on efficiency, we run incredibly well on sort of mid-tier processors. We don't need a billion cores or anything like that. We're very, very efficient. Uh, so what generally is the motivation, if you will, to upgrade uh, tends to be bandwidth of the motherboard itself. Uh, and so that's the, the move from PCI Gen 3 to 4 to 5. And as I said, all of those can be done seamlessly uh, without any uh, disruption or data migration. Okay, great. Um, one other question on the, on the mixing and matching uh, drive sizes that sure. came in here. You know, could you mix and match both the drive sizes and the vendors, or do you need to you know, stick with a, a particular vendor? Uh, so the, the simple answer is uh, you can mix vendors. The little bit more complex ven, uh, answer, and I don't want to get any vendors in trouble here. None of the guys are on, on, the, on the mega cache would be involved in this. <laughs> but uh, the, the hard drive vendors, uh, if you buy their JBOD, uh, it, for some reason, strangely, uh, only accepts their drives. Uh, so you have to be a little uh, careful with that. Uh, 
but that that's really the the only uh, the only issue. Uh, so uh, if you buy a, ironically, if you buy a third party uh, JBOD, you can put anybody's uh, drives in it. So it, it, mm. it's a conversation we would have with the customer as far as hey, hey if you want a turnkey, hundred percent, we're going to support it. Uh, you know, we're going to agree to a vendor, and if that vendor says, hey, you can only put my drives in my JBOD, uh, then that's a problem. Now, what you can do, your second JBOD, right, your second enclosure, that could come from the other uh, hard drive. There's only three, so i got to be careful how I say this. Uh, the other hard drive vendor, and you can mix the, the two enclosures. We can handle that, no problem. We're totally abstracted from the hardware layer, so we don't, uh, we don't have any issues there. Okay, great. Um, next question is is about uh, pricing. Just you know, in broad strokes, is, is it a consumption pricing model, or, or how does that work? Yeah, that's a great question. So, uh, as I said, we try to meet the customer where they are. So, if if uh, you want to essentially bring your own hardware, uh, we have a, a pretty uh, uh, easy spec to meet there. As I said, we're very efficient. Uh, and we can provide you just software on a capacity uh, basis. I would say most of our customers uh, want a turnkey experience, uh, which we can also ap uh, apply as well. Now, what I, I think it is a little unusual about us is that you can go to our website. There's a button at the top called True Price, and you can price out a solution. We show all the pricing of the turnkey systems right on the front, uh, right on our website, so we don't play the whole, you know, wait to the end of the quarter. You know, type of thing. You can get pricing right now if you want to. Okay. Um, in 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 line with the uh, the the flash first uh, philosophy, how how big can that flash tier be? Uh, yeah. Again, another great question. So it, it really is dependent on you. Uh, the 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 flash tier typically, you know, especially in, again in the back of use case where we and the customer are kind of concerned about cost. Uh, so typically, it's a lot. Of, many times, it's eight drives. Uh, it, it could be eight fifteen point six terabyte drives, so it could be fairly large from that perspective. But it can. I have other customers that look at it and go, you know what? Uh, I'll, I'll get twelve or I'll get twenty four because I want to do more in that flash tier. And you can also. We also give you the uh, flexibility of changing your mind. You could start with eight drives, and if you say, wow, this is really working, but I want to use it a little bit more for, uh, you know, storing even more backups in the flash tier. Well, again, all you do is just drop more drives in, right? And so you can start with eight, and if you really like it, you can say, okay, I'll take it to 12, or I'll take it to 24, or beyond. And that's just a, you know, a game time decision that you uh, make. So it's very easy to do, and very easy to change your mind on. Excellent. Okay, well, George, thank you so much for for being on with us. Thanks for a great presentation and and all your uh, thank you. thoughtful answers. Uh, yeah, uh, great stuff. Thank you. Okay. Well, that is going to wrap it up for the presentations. We do have one last piece of business, and that is the final prize drawing uh, for, for today's Megacast. So the first drawing is for the $500 Amazon gift card, and that one goes to Jeff White of Virginia. And then we have one more grand prize the Apple M1 24-inch iMac, and this one goes to Keith Young from Mississippi. So congratulations to Jeff and to Keith, and we'll be in touch about your uh, about details on how to claim a prize. So with that, we are at the end of our event. Just wanted to give a quick reminder about some of the other great actual tech media resources out there. There's the the Gorilla Guides. Um, Check out the, the Gorilla Guide Book Club to get lots of fantastic technical information um, in a really easy to read and understand format. If you like printed or downloaded materials, these, these are as good as it gets. And if you uh, were on the, the Megacast today and, and you, you liked what you, you saw and you you'd really want to be um, in front of this audience with your own solutions, please get in touch with us at connect at actualtechmedia.com. And finally, refer a friend to our online events, and, and you both could win a $300 Amazon gift card. So with that, I'll just say 
thanks to everybody for attending. Thanks for all your great questions, um, and uh, and thanks to the the sponsors for their presentations today. Have a great day.